Black Moon, Stormborn Saga Book 5, written by J.T. Williams. A short note from the author. Thank you to each of you who has taken the time to like and comment on my videos. I try to respond to each of you. If you haven't yet subscribed, please do. Thank you for listening. Now back to the book. Part 1. Heroes of Salmark. Salmark did not rest. Her armies prepared. King Suvasel of the Elves of the Varmark Woodlands prepared to march, and two separate hosts made their plans. But in the darkness beneath Salemark, beyond the sight of singing elves and where the moon was upon the trees of the woods at night, and the sun shine down now, out of sight of the friendlier types, King Suvasel had brought Avorn and Fadis down to where the prisoner was kept. Blood sprayed against the wall as the would-be assassin was thrown across a wooden table. The two Varmark elves passed the man between them, slapping and striking as his form sank further into the ground each time he fell. You will speak, King Suvasel said. I am not like most of my kin, choosing a higher road of excellence. I know what those of Taria do to their prisoners, and I feel returning the same treatment in kind to be the best response. The king chugged from a chalice, wine running down the bottom of his chin. Fadis was surprised to see an elf act like this, but the whispers he had heard just since this morning made sense. Suvasel was the warrior lord of the elves, deemed by the once king to one day lead the elves if ever war came to the woods. He was not a student of great wisdom, but instead had taken himself to the furthest reaches of the lands, even once to the Shadowlands, to learn of war and fighting. The two elves held the Rusis in place. At this moment, the king revealed a small grub from the woods. This is a fairy, a fairy of death, I'd say, he said, allowing the creature to walk over his gauntlet. They are quite fickle creatures. If fed a diet of flower petals, they create a beautiful garden within a few days, weaving their magic to and from, like a spider creating webs, but, in this case, creating beauty as an elf would. But, he paused, rubbing a substance on the table, if they consume the ground-up contents of this particular mushroom, not found near these regions, I'll tell you, they will kill even a great oak of these woods in a matter of a few days. A rusus? Well, I'd give you three days before death is upon you. I know that before that time the truth shall roll off your tongue as if you had been pleasured with great wine and beautiful women to coerce you. You'll give me what I want, and then you'll die. So to avoid this, he said, allowing the creature to consume the ground-up mushroom. I give you one last chance to tell me from where you come from, where the king has summoned so many Rusis, and whom else I must destroy to secure the elves of the West from ever being attacked again. The man stared at the grub eating the mushroom. Evern tapped Fadis. I see that this elf is well-traveled. That is a shadow cap, a mushroom that grows in the east. He had to deal with my people to know such alchemy. This king is a strange one. Suvasel did not cease his staring at the Rusus. Truly, so foolish to remain silent when before you were shouting of our fall. Fine, have it your way. The two elves kicked the man behind his knees, bending his arm backward as they thrust the side of his head on the table. One of them squeezed his face, pushing his lips apart. Suvasel took the fairy and shoved it in the Rusi's mouth. They forced his mouth closed. The man tried to spit. He flailed, kicking and stomping. Suvasa leaned down to his level. It is the wonder of this particular creature. You do not eat it. It eats into you. No doubt, it has traveled into the space near where the air is brought into your chest. There it will wait, poisoning you until your body gives out and it can begin to devour you. I will be patient in my waiting. They pulled him from the table, dragging the Rusis along the floor. Please, Elf, I do not know what you seek. I would tell you if I did. Please, Elf, I am not what you think. You are an assassin. You are a Shadow Elf and a Rusis, a strange combination. But it is what it is in these dark times. Tell me now, where are you from? You are a fool, Elf. I have told you what you wish. You will be the doom of your kingdom. Your rash actions will bring about your death. 
as do yours. You came against the elves of the West. I would send your body to that wretched king of Taria, but by the time you're dead, so will he be as well. The Ruses spat at Suvasel. One of the elves punched him in the stomach in return. The king balled his fist to follow the strike of his elf kin, but recoiled. I will avenge all that has been lost, and I will be the last king of the West, whoever deals with those who would come with open arms against our people, for all shall fear the name Suvasel in time. As the man was dragged into the darkness of the elven dungeons, Suvasel looked at Evorn and Fadis. Do you think your fairy will be enough? Evorn asked. It matters little. The king will die, he said, looking at Fadis. And you depart with Ruach to secure our people from the scourge of the vampires. He pointed to Evorn. I have already sent envoys to all elven villages to be on guard. In time I will lead my people as I did against the orcs of old. The elves of the Varmark woodlands will forever stand. By my life, I swear it. The king departed, and Fadis and Evern followed slowly behind him, back up to the lower level of the central tower. Is the captain ready? Evern asked. The best I know. I meet with others to discuss our path soon. As do I, Evern said. As they reached the ground level, Evern and Fadis took their leave of one another. There was much work to be done. In a now smoke-filled room not too far from where they had attempted to sleep the last night, Fadis stared over diagrams and sketches that Kirla had drawn. He, Evry, and Andok were working to solidify their approach to the king's castle. The city was Tar Vera, a large bastion that was once a dwarven tower but was given to the race of men by dwarves in the region to help them weather the harsh winters. So the ship is near invisible? Andok asked, sipping an elven ale. Near, its power is beyond anything of the elves, to be honest, Fadis said. Our approach will not be too difficult, Every stated. It will be our execution once within the structure. The rogue Kirla has a plan? Fadis didn't like it but she did. He pointed to a spot near the back of the castle. She says there is a door used by the kitchen staff. We can get into the castle that way. The issue is that the door itself can only be opened from the inside and is only opened once a week to push out old supply from the kitchen. Otherwise, the disgusting rats only stack up their trash. She said that the old cook is a fool. I worry not of cooks, Every said. So Curla plans to sneak in? Andok asked. Yes, as a concubine of the king. He takes new women nearly every night from a rotating group of taverns. She plans to sneak into the group, taking a woman's place. Evidently, these women are not always so willing, so finding one who will let her assume their identity shouldn't be too hard. Risky, Andok said. I might like to take the front gate with heavy arrow fire, but the bastard has been fortifying. Badur and I have been staying away from those of Taria, but we've crossed paths with our fellow rangers. To be honest with you both, we've found significant wealth in the old dwarven mines. We've been working to support a resistance within Taria to overthrow the king. Kirla and her guild were part of that. But these Rusis who arrived a few weeks ago complicated everything. The shadow elf Evern seems to believe they are paid warriors from the east. So could we pay them off? Perhaps? We should just kill them, Every said. Fadis looked up at him. True, but all options must be examined. Every sighed. The leaves of Sailmark have but one option. As Every's companions came into the room, he stood and went to them. We go to prepare for our exodus and to be blessed by the High Archons. Such oaths are not taken lightly in Sailmark. I suggest you assure your captain is ready. As Evry left, Fadis shook his head and looked over to Andok. I never thought my son would become nearly an elf himself. Well, you did leave him, the ranger said. We had thought you were dead. We knew you left, but Taria is small compared to these vampires. We defeated a clan of them once, but it wasn't easy. 
We knew they would attempt something again, but nothing to this level. It was one hour from midday. Thadis pushed off from the desk. Come, the host leaves for the Crescent Lake soon. The two rangers met up with Badur and proceeded outside. Though the smoldering wreckage from the night before still cast a disgusting smell in the air, a northern wind swept down, bringing the sweet smell of lavender upon Sailmark. Even so, as they exited the grounds of the tower and headed into the city, the constant reminders of the events from the last few days were ever evident. The destruction wrought by the attacks had more than left an impression. Fikmarkian elves, in their heavy battle armor and unfriendly stares, were everywhere. Archons with glowing staves patrolled the top of the buildings, and the younger elves hid behind their parents as they walked through the city streets. The ever-increasing size of the memorial for the once king of Sailmark had continued to grow, Several archons were at the base of the memorial, and it was here they found Evern. The host is supposed to depart, yet you are here? Fadis asked. Falrin was not too far from Evern and walked over to Fadis. Avern has been praying over the memorial itself. It seems ill thoughts have entered his mind of the coming days. Evorn seemed to mutter something to himself, and then looked over to Fadis. When a king dies in the east, it is customary to take many days to grieve him, and even warring clans will not fight when the head of a clan is killed. It is an act of respect among shadow elves. This king will become like a tree within Sailmark, a ceremony to be enacted by King Suvasel before the turn of night. I did not know this king very well, he said, motioning to the memorial but he was fairer than most of those I have known. Avern bowed, turning then to Valrin. Keep yourself well, young one. You should not be one of the fools going into the king of Taria's domain, he said, glancing at Fadis. We took on the Barb King. This is a joke in comparison. You speak some truth, Avern said, but the Barb King was not of the race of men. This king seems a coward, something Fadis mentioned from the start. I do not trust him in the least, and I do not feel you will simply walk right into the castle. Fadis laughed. We will run. Indeed, Ranger, watch yourself. Take care of your son. We don't need another quest to save someone else. I do think we need to get back to our glacial seas soon. Evern turned from them and quickly walked away. Andok and Fadis walked with Valrin. A strange elf, Andok said and I've known many elves. Yes, Fadis said, but be happy he is on our side. They proceeded out of the city to the border of the charred woods where many stags were assembled. Ruach, the warrior from before, was addressing the king over a map with Aviam. We should arrive by night tomorrow, Ruach said, just in time for the black moon. We will hold the ground for your arrival, king. Suvasel embraced Ruach. I'd send my son with you, but I'd prefer to send any other warrior. I have sent him back to Fikmark. Perhaps where he lacks in blade work, he can work into improving with politics. With the entire forward guard of Fikmark, Archons from both our home and Sailmark, and Avium and the Shadow Elf, I have seen the strangers fight, and between all of us, I dare any bloodsucker to attempt to take those ruins. From Sailmark, the High Archon Reviac came with a large chest. Purification stones, he said. Something to help you upon that first night. Several other Archons arrived with him, these on horseback. With them was Rikt, the purified one. We have blessed all who depart, Reviac went on to say, both with you, Ruach, and those who go elsewhere. He glanced to Fadis. Fadis bowed. Our mission will be underway by nightfall. Good luck with such, Ruach said. The elf captain strapped on his helmet and took to his mount. The stag shook its horns as Ruach blew a horn. Elves of Sailmark, prepare for exodus. The host assembled in a rough half-moon with Evern now on one of the creatures with Avium mounting another. 
Valrin stood next to Fadis. I like the ocean more than land. I do not like seeing our crew split up again. Indeed, I much think I'd prefer if we were together. Evorn and Ivium looked back to Fadis and Valrin. Evorn made a slight bow, and Ivium smiled. Bry happened to run up with Curla beside her. We made it just in time, Bry said. Ruach blew his horn again. For the trees of Sailmark, beside Vindus the Deep, may the stars and light of Aether be upon us. May the black moon rise and sink without fail as its form is upon us these next few nights. May elven steel stand stalwart this night and for all that come after. Another horn call, this one from Sailmark. The city itself gave a trumpeting send-off as the winds blew through the trees. Fadis noticed a large gathering of leaves near the host, and in a flash, around thirty additional horses appeared with leaves of Sailmark upon their backs. Lord Relia rode up to King Suvasel. Good king, I and many of my guard ride with Ruach. Upon your departure, High Archon Reviac will have steward over Sailmark. The leaves of Sailmark shall blow from the woods and unto the darkness that comes. Suvasel bowed. Light of Ether upon you. Relia pointed to Fadis. Keep your son alive, he said. He then spurred his horse and rode quickly off to join the departing host. The ground shook with the hooffalls of the many beasts, carrying the elves to the east. Suvasel jerked his glance toward Fadis and the others. I trust you are well on your path to begin the voyage to rid the living realm of this king of Taria. Indeed, Fadis said. I wish to preside over the ceremony for the once king, and then I will lead the second host to the east. The ships from Vueric carry a great elven host, a host returning from a voyage across the sea. We sought a great treasure, but it seems our journey must be cut short. Treasure? asked Valrin. Nothing for the mind of a boy, Captain. But no, we elves will defend this ground. Kill that king and rally those of Taria to fight as well, if you can. I do believe it may come time for the race of men to align with the elves. Perhaps we can, Andok said. And of the dwarves? I'd rather their ilk remain in the bowels of the world than insult me with their presence. I'll take allies with men before any of their wretched souls. The king snapped away from them, and the many attendants with him began back to Sailmark. High Archon Reviac bowed to them. I work to reset the defenses and realign the crystals to overcharge. They will be visible to the enemy with that effect, but we must assure our home is safe. I intend to keep it so. Please, join us for the ceremony for once King Tursua. He would have wanted your presence. Valrin and Bry followed Reviac back to Sailmark, and Andok departed to find his friend Badur. The rangers were then going to join up with Evry, who was supposed to be meeting Valrin at the docks. Kirla needed Fadis. It's Riller. He's doing better, but not great. He's not too happy about our plans. The rogues led Fadis back into the tower and up to the area where Riller had been lying. Now the dwarf was sitting on the balcony with a cup of tea. The hospitality of the elves is something, he said, smiling as they approached. Be this a dwarven home after an elven attack, and you'd be lucky to not be in a dungeon. Kirla sat down next to Riller as Fadi stood off to the side. Lots of strangers, Riller said, looking at Fadis. I've been told you're one of the crew of the ship that helped ferry us away from the hell of Taria. Now you're one of the fools going with this fool, he said, motioning toward Curla. You don't need to go. Let those others do it. You know I know the interior of Tarvira better than anyone. Riller growled. I know. That bastard needs to die. So he will. We've been planning this, Curla said. He needs to die with my axe in his throat. I know what he did to you, and now you're putting yourself back in that position. I won't be alone, Curla said, staring at Fadis. Who, him? Now that is an ugly woman. No, Bry, the Rusus. Valrin knows of this plan, Fadis asked. He does, 
He wants extra protection for me. We're going to have to get into one of the concubine groups for the king's nightly soiree. Nightly? Fadis asked. That king can barely hold up a sword for longer than twenty minutes. Ha! Riller shouted. Now that is funny. But dear sir, that is not what he uses these women for. Curla sighed and looked away. He uses us for that, but he enjoys strange fetishes that are deemed uncivilized by most. He... I don't care, Fadis said. If you and Bry can get the secret passage in the kitchen open, we can take care of the rest. Whatever he is doing, it will end. Riller stood up and nearly fell back down. And that is why you must remain here, Curla told the dwarf. I just hate this. First your father. Now I am stuck in this place with fine tea, mind you. But all our friends are dead, Curla. Every one of the guild struck down by that king. I want to be there when he breathes his last. The battle will be over and I'll be stuck here. Be watchful, Fadi said. Has she told you of the recent events? Yes, vampires or something. Then you should know that even here there are great risks. Nowhere is safe right now, and perhaps Kirla's journey is the safest. You do not know us, Riller, but we will not abandon Kirla. To me, she is a part of our crew, as are you. Riller nodded, and Kirla smiled wildly at him. Maybe we don't want to be, she teased to Fadis. Come now, Riller. Do you wish to remain here, or attend the ceremony for the once king? Riller forced himself to stand, using Curla for assistance. The elf king allowed the passage of a dwarf into his city, and cared for me even after a dwarven attack. I can stand for him. Out at the village memorial, the abundance of flowers had grown into a large mass covering the body of the once king. An uncountable assembly surrounded the altar, and off to the side stood King Suvasel. Raviac held his staff over the altar, and a great wisp of blue magic rolled into the ground, almost as if carving out the spot where the once king lay. Valrin, Bry, Evry, and the sworn leaves who were to depart aboard the Aela Sunrise with them joined Andok, Badur, Fadis, Kirla, and Riller. What is to happen? Valrin asked. High Archon Reviac will ask the gods to bless the once king, Evry said. If the gods agree, he shall become of the woods. By the light of Etha, in the heavens dark, starlight and moonfall were but the last piece of his waking life. Once king of Salemark, lord of all the woodlands of the west, steward of elves, the one thousand splinter of the fell wars, here now I proclaim your accolades. Orc filth surrounded the great trees south of Wurik. Upon mountaintop the lone captain had lost all, with elf blade forged in the north. A song was sung from Mountain Peak, with a choir of bloodshed. The orcs called him Splinter, and before the gods one thousand heads were hewed. I, Reviac, High Archon of Salemark, ask Etha to bless our brother forever. Reviac's words were just complete when a great fire took the memorial. Both Valrin and Fadis looked at one another, amazed that though the fire grew high and bright, they did not feel any warmth from it. The flames lifted high into the sky, almost as if building into a great form of a single flame, and the three branches above it split off, opening up the very flames to reach through. There was a shimmer of blue within the fire, and then a deep green that shifted white. Thunder rolled, and there was another flash. When the light returned to normal, where had been towering flames was now a massive tree, reaching high above Sailmark with sparkling fruit in the boughs above. From within the tree itself flew hundreds of fairies, and wherever the tiny fairies went throughout the other trees, tiny glowing crystals spread out in the boughs above, almost as if a night sky were above them. Etha, patron goddess of the elves, Raviac shouted. Thank you for your blessing upon Selmark's sons and daughters. May your continued blessings be upon us and our new king, Suvasel of Fikmark, lord of the woods. The many elves in the great assembly cheered, 
but Suvasel already moved away from the memorial. His generals surrounded him, and it seemed the king was already back to focusing on his greater task at hand, if he had even paused thought of it while at the memorial. Thadis watched him depart, and then looked to Valrin. Is the ship ready? Seems to be, Valrin said. We have an oversupply of weapons, elvish food, and though there are still marks from the explosion, the crystals are intact. According to some I spoke to by the docks, there are tides that will make our journey along the coast much swifter, starting at near sunset. I assume we'll leave then. I spoke with every of this, and he suggests we rest until then. Considering we did not sleep last night, Every said, I am good with that. Rest, prepare, and know that hopefully by the end of tomorrow night our task will be complete, and we can return here to meet up with our friends who went east. Such plans, said Curla. Dethrone a king, stop an invasion of vampires, and by day three we'll be relaxing under the trees. They returned to the great tower, making a point to rest while they could. Reviac had come to watch over them. The High Archon, though stalwart, was deeply troubled, and Fadis could not sleep as it was. You worry? Fadis asked him. The elf stirred a cup of herbal tonic and looked to the ranger. I remember when the orc came. I remember the elves who departed to attempt to quell the uprising, and how their bodies were dismembered and sent along the river to us. I try not to distress. I ensure that other Archons do not see my own dismay, but in truth, we are all troubled, worn down by the nightmares and ill feelings in the trees. The woods tremble with the taint of coming poison. The Blightlands would destroy our woods and sap this region of life. For such hollow forms like vampires and such vile creatures as demon men, I almost prefer orc adversaries. Thadis poured himself some wine. You hope Taria will help us fight the creatures? The elf slurped his tonic. They shall want to, in my thoughts. The vampires will go after them to recruit their dead into the ranks of demon men, which will soon be filled with elven kin, if I were to guess. We call them demon men, but that is because the race of men were easier prey. Once elves begin to fall, they will augment the ranks of the demon men. We must halt their advances. Thadis placed his bow on the table and began inspecting his bowstrings. Several were frayed, and though the elf before him was not an archer, he raised his lip at the sight of the ranger's bow. That is elvish wood, an elven bow, yet the string you put between its arms are inferior for lack of a better word. Fadis snickered. I guess it is what I had in the north. You're not in the north anymore. Reviac reached into his robes. I may be a man of magic, but I do not shy away from archery. As it stands, I have a string for you, taken from the mares that graze west of Narasond, the elven kingdom of the east. You come from there? Fadis asked. Indeed, I do wish to return under the great lamps of our people, burning high in the mountains. Those of the west judge our kin to the east, but in truth, those of Narasond have never been at war as we have in the West. I guess that is why they are judged so harshly, especially by our new king, Suvasel. He is a proud elf, stalwart and strong. If any an elf to wish their own death, it would be Suvasel. He died proudly with a sword in hand as a thousand arrows fell from the sky. In truth, I should not speak of such things of our people at this late hour. The nightmares have worsened, Fadis. Fadis bowed as he placed his hand on the elf's shoulder. We of the Aela Sunrise will not let Sailmark fall. My friends who went to the east are not the types to fail. We are with you, Riviac. Do not fear. Fadis took the bowstring as Riviac stood. Rest, Ranger of the North. Fell deeds awake you upon your journey. Fell deeds awake us all. The High Archon departed. Fadis bounced the string in his hand. The nearly clear, translucent bowstring was weightless, and as he strung his bow, he pulled back on the string with near effortless motion. He wondered of what would happen in Taria. 
Thoddis lay down, staring for a moment at Valrin and Bry and to Kirla. He closed his eyes. With the fall of night, the crew of the Ayla Sunrise gathered near the docks. King Suvasel was present, but not with the grand entourage he had been seen with before. He had a few other elves with him for protection, Fikmarkian elves. Reviac and several archons were present as well. The leaves of Sailmark wore no adornment but simple robes. Their elvish armor was well hidden underneath it, but Fadis noticed that every wore his Dwemhar device, as did the others. Falling leaves of Sailmark named for the deeds of one elf, Suvasel said. I was never of the leaves, for I was not of Sailmark, but you are a proud order. I am more impressed by you, Every. You're not of elven blood, yet you stand as equal to your fellow elf. Truly, your father should be proud of such. Thoddis smiled, but Every's expression didn't change. He took a knee with his fellow leaves. By our honor, we will avenge the once king and bring honor to all within the woodlands. As they stood, Suvasel bowed in turn. Go with the blessing of your people, he said, looking at Every and then to the other elves. Valrin, Kirla, and Bry were at the helm as Fadis boarded with Andok and Badur. I understand that the term falling leaves is one of drear for the elves, Bry said. It signifies their alignment with death and the falling leaves of fall. Fadis shook his head, looking back to see the elves boarding the ship. Valrin dropped the sails, and with an orange sunset before them beyond the great gate of the elves that led to the seas, they pulled away from the coast. Fadis looked back at the king and those with him. Even now, smoke still smoldered on the edge of the woodlands, and for a moment he saw all those standing there wiped away, and only the splash of rocks on a barren shore where Sailmark once stood. He turned away and forced the thought from his mind. The Ayla sunrise cut through the water, moving towards the great gate, which was opened as they approached. A single beacon of blue fire erupted at the gateway, and the elves aboard the ship drew back their arrows along with every. They each spoke something under their breaths, and their arrows burst into white flame. They released their arrows over the ocean, passing over the beacon of blue fire. Truly, brother, one of the elves said to every, we are given the honor of those who fought in the Orc Wars. Every smiled and embraced the elf before him. Vuri, we go towards fate. We must embrace it. Vuri nodded. Well, I know one of the names of the crew, Valrin said. Vuri, who else is with you? Vuri was the tallest of the elves. He had long blonde hair and, in truth, did not look much different from the other two. These two are brothers, Revlas and Bevlas. The other is Nekeli. Vuri, Revlas, Bevlas and Nekeli, good. I am Valrin. This is Bry, Rusis. The other is Kirla. The one with the dwarf, Revlas said. Yes, she responded. Your dwarf, he tells us to make sure you do not die. Sounds like Riller. Revlas looked at Bevlas and then back to Kirla. We told him we would not watch his love. Fadis looked to Kirla for some form of annoyance, but the rogue just snidely smiled. Good thing I am not his love. Revlas laughed. I like you, Kirla. As the Ayla sunrise passed through the gateway, Valrin spun the wheel, tossing the ship onto a northern trek. The current took the ship, and they began to make good headway. He reached behind him and twisted one of the crystals, sending a ripple of energy across the deck, and even the leaves of Sailmark looked suddenly at him afterward. The wood of the ship shifted to a much darker shade, and the glow of the crystals along the deck softened. From the shore, we are now near invisible. A realm ship, said Nikeli. I had read of such things, but only imagined them. Have not any of you seen Dwemhar, considering how long you have lived? Kurla asked. Some elves are old, Revlas said. We are all under five hundred years, very young in our people's eyes. Young? Kurla laughed. I guess it is a point of view. All of you are but children, 
Bevla said, except Every. Every was looking out at the ocean, not paying attention to the others. Fadis noticed this. As the winds of the glacial seas blew upon them, but did not change their course in the slightest, he went and sat with his son. He did not speak, for nothing was needed to be said. Every seemed to calm just with his father's presence. Part 2. Night Journey For most of the initial leg of their flight to the east, the host from Sailmark meant to secure the ruins at Crescent Lake had maintained a near flawless gallop at nearly full speed. The stags of the Varmark woodlands did not tire as normal horses, and even the steeds of Sailmark had remarkable resilience. As the host traveled, Archon stayed on the outer wings, with Ruach leading from the front. Evern and Evium rode not too far from Lord Relia, and as a brisk night fell upon them, they came into much rockier ground, forcing them to considerably slow their pace. Evern noticed that the Archons became much more restless with the fall of darkness. He kept watch on their surroundings, considering the large white moon above did nothing but accent how out of place their host was in otherwise wild lands. They are fearful, Evium said to Evern. Their fear will attract these beasts. There once were vampires in the Shadowlands, and they can sense fear. I dare say they are attracted to it. There are, he corrected her. We call them blood elves, but they are not simple elves who employ blood magic. Shadow elves can be vile. Blood elves can be something else entirely. Vampires are part of the Shadowlands, but they do not act like these. We have no demon men types in the East. Lord Relia fell back to ride beside them. I hear your talk. You do not know of these vampires and the pact? You made a pact with these creatures? Aviam asked. In a word, yes. But in truth, we removed them from our realm, gave them a place out of touch with the normal living realm, a hidden elven place repurposed for them. A hidden realm? Yes, like a realm known as Erlus, a place of the blades, hidden from all except those who know it. Evern looked to Evium and then back to Relia. Yes, we understand of a place such as that. Relia looked up and around, watching the skies and seeing that several Archons had circled back from the front as the host widened their watch on their flanks. This place was one they could live and be free of the confines of blood. They did not need to feed within these places. It was an alternative to death. So, I will ask the obvious question, why did the elves not destroy them? At the time, many elves sought ascension like the Dwemar. Killing for no reason but fear is not along that path. Good thing I'm not on such a path. I hope none of this host care for that either. No, there is much I could say of our fallen king, but of this new king, Suvasel, killing has never been something he was reserved on. If any king was to lead us in these times, it should be Suvasel of Fikmark. But I digress. The vampires of our region were once much more powerful, claiming sanctity and a spot as a chief race above humans. A war existed between Rusus and vampires for a time, and in that war, vampire lord Elria Sona was killed. He was a powerful being, not of the race of men, but something crafted by a rogue demigod and given life by magic. With his fall, a new vampire took the title as lord, but this vampire was a turned elf. The claim by the vampire as a chief race fell away, as most considered them just cursed beings versus a race led by a powerful leader, as was Elria Sona. With that fall, the war escalated, and in that time, elven magic created many shifting creatures. Those who would be as you and I then could shift into a beast form. These creatures were immune to the turning bites of a vampire, and such, the great race forged by Elria Sona was decimated. The few remaining clans studied many forms of magic, and then elf lords began dying, bitten in the middle of the night, and then becoming raging nightmares, killing many high elves in the process. We and the Rusis could not stop them, and the Dwemhar had stepped away from our lands. Thus, we made a pact. Now it seems that pact is not enough, and they seek a path back to our world to possibly establish the domain of Elria Sona. What domain did Elria have? Aveam asked. 
All of the west, from the desert coastline all the way to the Tycan Mountains, or so the bloodsuckers saw it. Screeching suddenly came from the host's right flank. The Archons crafted a hasty ward, sending it up the sky and forming a white shroud. Evern looked up, lifting his staff as several creatures blew through the ward and were engulfed in white flames. The elves repositioned their stags. Blades flashed to position in the moonlight. The Archons on the left flank cast additional wards that shot up and combined with the wards on the opposite side. Several more creatures flew through the wards before trees fell into the ranks, breaking the lines and forcing the elves to rush to reform. Shrieks tore through the night air, and from the trees clamored vile small creatures like children, but with blanched skin, gray in the moonlight. The creatures hissed and went for the stags. There were no commands, no unified shouting as would come from a line of soldiers of men. The elves on stags moved in unison, their blades swinging hard upon the creatures that assailed the host. Archons shot ice into the woods beyond, and in a flash of fire that erupted from the woods and over the host, Evern and Aveum spotted several tall figures on a hill high within the woods. Ruach rode down the line, not at all unaware of the watchers in the woods. He pointed his wand, and a fireball of blue magic erupted forth, sending a blast of trees at the area near where the shadowy forms stood. Though the woods burned with arcane fire, the shadows remained. Evern stared at these vampires of the West, these vile creatures who seemed nothing like the blood elves he had known. As the fiery magic began to subside, the shadowy forms high upon the hill vanished. The near endless swarms of strange creatures, though easily cut down, ceased, and as quickly as the attack had come, it was over. Reform! Move east! Ruach shouted. Part 3. Coast of Taria. Fadis stared at the rocky coasts before him. He slept in a bit past dawn, but Bry and Kirla were already awake, as were Evry, Nikeli, Andok, and Badur. Bevlas and Revlas woke up at near noon, but from what he was told they typically were up for night watch in Sailmark. That first cup of coffee was solemn, but now on his third he tried to hide the nervousness in his stomach. An assassination was something he'd never done. Sure, he had wished to kill the king, but this was a bit different. Kirla and Bry had been going over hasty drawings and matching them with what she had done before. The entire plan hinged on the way into the kitchen. Are you sure you can even get into the castle? Every asked. I know we can move on to the walls. I question if we even need the assistance of the others, Nikeli said, having spent most of the morning sharpening his throwing knives. These are men, not elves. We can move fast enough that it will not matter if we have to spend some amount of time orienting ourselves. The king has dwarven locking systems, Kurla said. At one sound of alarm or any reason to believe the security has been thwarted, they can lock down the keep. This is not a plan I put into action because I just want to take part. We must do it as laid out, or there is no sense in even attempting this. So, both you and Bry will attempt entry? Fadis asked. As it seems though I think it will be easier if it is just myself. You are young, Rusis. Have you any skill in coercion and seductiveness? You do not seem the type. Bry laughed. Sure, I can coerce. We're lying our way into the keep, not actually lying down and using what you're suggesting. Curla grinned. Fine, but we must also take the spot and play as we've been captured. I do not need to play at that. Once in the glacial seas... That scenario was real for me. We come around the edge of the cape. There are vessels ahead, Valrin shouted out. Down below, Fadis shouted. Hide! If we are boarded and searched, we'll figure that out as it happens. I thought we could hide the vessel, Every asked. It uses substantial energy to do so, Valrin said. I'd rather us sail past those not deemed to be a sure threat. If needed, we can vanish but as now we look like a simple passenger vessel. Every didn't seem convinced. I hope your story works, father.
As Fadis closed the hatch with the others hidden below deck, he placed his bow along the railings out of sight of those on other vessels and began cutting bait in a bucket. An innocent enough activity. Valrin kept them away from the shoreline, giving the other two vessels a wide berth. Fadis stared up the shoreline. It was a watch camp on the edge of the woods with a port and three vessels at the dock. The other two vessels were sentry ships, essentially assuring that none came within the port. It was not uncommon for vessels to travel this way. Most were either headed to the islands further east or to Locum, a city of men south of Taria on the coast of the Great Bay of the North. They were not too far from the king of Taria's domain, but that was not their direct path. The next cape was the village of Tarivek, the place where his journey had begun so many years ago. They reached the other edge of the cape and made it around without the two sentry ships stopping them. He sighed in relief and went to the hatch to let the others know, when Valrin turned the wheel of the ship hard, nearly throwing Fadis. There was another vessel, hidden just on the other side of the rocks. The near collision caused the other ship to drop its sails in response, moving behind and soon, alongside the Ayla Sunrise. Valrin slowed, and archers appeared on the deck of the opposing ship. Fadis was near his bow, but there were at least twenty arrows aimed at them. Halt your vessel! a voice shouted out. Valrin dropped anchor as the other ship did the same, moving a bit in front of his ship. You fly no flag of the realms. From where do you sail? Vuerik, Fadis lied. We travel to Locum. We seek fishing rigs and have special correspondence with the fisher who makes the best. We travel without a flag to avoid pirates and smuggler types. The Vinda's seas are infested with such types. We understand your plight, but these waters are under the crown of Taria. You must have notations from the king himself to travel this way. The king owns the waters? Fadis asked. Of course. He owns all that his land looks upon. If it is within sight of Taria, it is the king's. Ship without a standard, you are to proceed to Tarivek with us. We must assure your vessel is properly marked from now on. You may remove the standard when you leave our waters as you wish. We will escort you. Valrin pulled anchor, having half a thought to open fire on the vessel and flee, but that would not help their cover, and at this point engaging the ship's defenses would do little beyond increase the alarm of Taria to watch the seas. What now? Valrin asked. We go to port. The others get off as quickly as possible. We'll deal with paperwork and get back to sea. Fadis went to the hatch where the others were hiding. The plan is the same. Bry and Kirla disembark. We will be searched, so every elves you must hide. We will be as leaves within the darkness, Every said. Perhaps your captain should have listened to me. This does not delay or harm our plans. I'd rather have the Ayla sunrise at peak readiness if we need it during our task versus using it to avoid small unpleasantries. Just be ready. Coming into port, Fadis stared at the familiar buildings he'd left so long ago. He had flashbacks to the robed man he'd spotted following him, and then he saw the smile of his once wife and then her bloodied body in the cave. A chill rolled over him, but it wasn't from the northern winds blowing upon the deck. Valrin brought the ship along dock, and Fadis jumped to tie them off. Valrin looked out and then went to the hatch. Come now. They are coming. The ship that had stopped them was coming into the port, but was still far enough back that they likely would not see Curla and Bry running to hide in town. Bry embraced Valrin as he passed. Better be there when we get that door open. She pecked him on the cheek. I will. You know I'll be waiting for you long before you're waiting for me. Fadis grinned to himself, acting as if he did not see the relationship between the captain and the Russes further developing. Curla punched him as he finished tying off the ship. Young love, don't make fun of it. I wasn't. She smiled and looked him up and down. I don't know your story, Ranger, but you shouldn't hate us women. Not all of us will leave when life rips you away. 
Evium told me your story. I am sorry about your wife. Fadis stood up and sighed. I was not her husband at that point, at least as she saw it. I've moved past it. I should have never left Evry. I know that now. I knew it then. Evry is well. Perhaps not what you imagined, but he seems happy. Be careful, rogue. She smiled again. Never. Her sarcasm was something else. Both Bry and Curla vanished into the streets as several men came from the vessel that had intercepted them. My name is Sheer, harbormaster here, one man said. Come, my men will check your ship and I'll get some paperwork done. We'll get you back on the seas quickly. Fadis and Valrin both watched as the men boarded the ship. Fadis prayed Evry and his companions could stay hidden long enough to avoid detection. The harbormaster took them into a small wooden building right on the water. Inside, Fadi saw the man had many maps and drawings, and even a drawing of what looked like Corson, the port city they called home while in the glacial seas. You've been to Corson? Fadis asked. The burly man stroked his beard and looked at the drawing behind him. Yes, as a young boy. Do you know it? I have taken spices there, Valrin said. Spices? Well, up there they need them. They need anything to keep warm. They each laughed, which helped take away some of the nervousness and seemed to cause the harbormaster a shift in stature. Okay, twenty gold coins for the processing and five for the standard. Valrin pulled out his coin purse and paid. Sure looked at the coins. Older coins. You've been to Seer? Some of the coins were given to him at Corson, but had been paid to the dwarven barkeep by traders from the far south. Yes, we picked up some fruit there not too long ago. Fadis was surprised at the almost natural lying Valrin was doing. Very well. Seer is a nice place. They used to have gladiatorial games in the arena. Quite a spectacle, I say. But no more. Perhaps one day they'll return. Sure put the coins in a drawer, and at that moment Fadis noticed the man had a dagger. It was a very particular dagger, and one he had seen before. Peculiar dagger? Sure slowly looked at him. What of it? he said plainly. One might say in your younger years, you preferred life in the woods. Much younger, and in a time when life was simpler. I wasn't charging taxes and handing out flags, but such is life now. Fadis stood, and Valrin did the same. Sure pushed the standard to Valrin. Captain, that red bit of cloth has been fought and earned by the king. He'll leave you alone while you're in his waters. Just fly it high. Sure stared at Fadis. You do plan to leave him alone. It isn't safe now for those of the woods. Fadis nodded. I am silent. Just a passing wind in the night. Sure had a bit of a smile, but then looked down. This is me now, Ranger. I am disgusted by it. Sail well, friends. Perhaps in another life I can draw back a bow again without threats on my head. I failed those who looked up to me. The departure from the harbor master's office was a silent one. They boarded the ship, cast off, and were well into the middle of the harbor before Valrin said anything. Who was that? By his dagger? A ranger captain. I didn't know him. But he got his companions killed or worse from his words. He has taken the life that the king would have had for me. Servitude. No one will be forced into that life if I have any say. Fadis made a point to check on Evry and the others. They were fine and undiscovered. They sailed out to sea, leaving the city of tar behind them. They would continue toward the dwelling of the king and prepare for tonight. It was up to the rogue and the ruses now. Part 4. The Sleeping City Morning came upon them, and the sun rose and was beginning to set again. The elven host had traveled with haste beyond that which was possible by any other gathering of forces in all the realm. Avern and Avium knew the distance they were to travel, 
and were equally surprised as to the speed of their travel. As the host of elves and rangers split around a massive rock in the center of a large field, Ruach ran his stag atop the rock itself. They had reached the far northern shore of the greater Crescent Lake. To the east, a smaller lake sat against the mountains. This was the lesser Crescent Lake. As a dragon would see from high above, the expanse would appear almost like an eye. Ruach pointed his sword to the western shore. At one time, this place was the home of the demigod. This place was what was marked on the map of the rangers, yet I see no returned city. That between realms is not always evident, Iveum said. Ruach led his stag down the rocks to some of the rangers from Taria. Rangers, do you know these woods? Only passing through, one of them said. This place is known to be haunted, regardless of its beauty. But there is decent cover within the circle of trees, though I wouldn't want to be caught with no egress between the lakes. Evorn and Avium noticed Richt jerking his glance in different directions. This place has changed much since I was last here, he said. Night will soon be upon us, and the dark moon will not wait for your memory, Ruach said. It is upon the western shore that the city was. I understand you claimed it has returned, and within it, a nodule of power. We must secure this place before nightfall. I also said it is overrun with demon men, Elf. Count a single blessing with the truth that if the city were here at this very moment, our host could have fallen under attack already. Several Archons came before Ruach, Tush with them. There is a great gathering of energy upon the lake, Tush said. I suggest we scout the region. This city was sent to another realm. Its reemergence in our lands may be only upon condition. Nightfall, Avium said. Perhaps they do not wish to reveal themselves yet. Ruach's stag seemed to buck unsteadily. The elf upon it was equally unsettled. Move along the western shore. Rangers cut down the center of the lake and then circle back north. He turned to several other stag riders. Riders of the High Star, scout the Lesser Crescent Lake, circle around to the north. Riders of the Burning North, go with the rangers and then scout the far southern plain. The last thing we need is to be outflanked. I will take the primary host to the western shore of the lake. The city of vampires was once high upon the rocky hills in that region. We shall see what we find. The host was on the move again. The two stag companies moved with haste as the large contingent of rangers disappeared into the trees. The men, said Evorn, they are like Fadis. These were his kin. Not so much kin, Ruach said. A brotherhood, fine men and women beyond that of the simple race. Their arrows are keen, and they stand beside elf kind. Not so true in the years before, but these rangers are of the Riverlands. They are of the city of Werik, a fine place to visit if you're looking for it. I prefer the seas, Evan said. Places of the south have never served me well. The same could be said of the north, Avium said. I do wonder of your adventures, Lord Relia stated. A realm ship, the frozen waste of the north. One of you should write a book of it sometime. I'll write it, Evan joked. Once I was alone upon my island, a ship nearly killed my friend. Then I was on a quest to save the lands, the end. Don't write a book, Evorn, Avium said. What? Don't like my simplicity? I think it was a rather enthralling recount. Well, I do believe you missed a few key points. Rossi the serpent slid down Evern's arm and then to the end of his staff before turning around and hissing at him. Rossi agrees with me, Aveum said. The snake doesn't care for the greater events. He's wondering why we're still riding. The host began a southern trek, the greater Crescent Lake to their side. Though the haunting premonitions upon them all were growing, the beauty of the lake country was entrancing. The night was clear, the stars were plentiful, and the archons amidst them lifted their staves, drawing in the energy of the night. Moon colors, Avium said. Our energy grows, Touche commented. 
We will no doubt need much in the coming hours. The moon edged upon the horizon. The host had reached the further western shore. Ruach dismounted, as did several of the others. I hear no horn call from our brethren, he said to Lord Relia. Yet, too, I see no sight upon these shores indicative of what we seek. I feel it, Aviam said, closing her eyes. There is something on the verge of our lands awaiting, but a time soon upon us. As the light of the moon began to shine greater, the stones within the lake began to shimmer and shake, a low vibration that caused the stags to further unnerve. Evium floated off her stag, much to the surprise of the elves around her. She rose into the sky, glowing faintly, and then pointed to the west. Your city, Ruach, appears. Fogs rolled like out of a cooking cauldron. That which was bare rock solidified in the distance, and as dark clouds circled above the lake, blotting out the starlight, the many spires of an ancient city appeared in the darkness. Green flames flickered to life up and down the walls of this massive place, and a growing host of creatures swarmed high above the city. There's the city, Evern said. Looks like a fine place. Ruach mounted his stag. He said nothing to the others, drawing his sword. For a moment, the stalwart elf let down his guard. Evern noticed he looked around at those around him, including Lord Relia. His breathing was heavy. Screeches tore across the silent night sky. Shall we advance? Touche asked. Ruach circled in place, further looking at those around him. Form a line, he shouted. Archons to the flanks. Tush departed, taking a position on the northern wing of the great host. To the south of them, the stags that had taken the route to the rangers were returning. Ruach rode to meet them, the others remaining behind. The arriving stags took a western path, Ruach riding hard to rejoin the host. They scout ahead. We advance. Keep tight formations. Brothers and sisters, some of you are too young to remember the scourge we face. Do not allow yourself to be bitten within the city. Though our magic can reverse a bite of a demon man within the city, you'll turn so quickly we will be forced to strike you down before... Sound horns. They know we're here. We must alert all our allies that it is time to advance. Will the gates simply be open? Evern asked. No door remains closed that we wish open, he replied. The host began their advance. Though the city was imposing as could be imagined, Evorn worried of the creatures swarming above. The lack of certainty with the plan at hand formed a distaste in his mind. Calm yourself, Aviam said. Stay out of my mind, and I am well, but I do not think this plan is as well thought out as it could be. Richt had been riding at different places and had settled just behind them. Do not worry yourself, Shadow Elf. Ruach knows our task. The nodule we seek is not hidden deep within the city, but at its center, a central platform. As it is in Sailmark, so it is here. Evorn stared at the outline of the city. It did resemble Sailmark. They are sister cities. Long ago, this too was a Dwemhar settlement. Though it was never destroyed, it shifted to the desires of its occupants. This is an echo of what it was once, the power of the city jaded and changed, meaning its Dwemhar qualities have faded away. Yet the power of the city has one purpose, to bridge the gaps between realms. Swear these damn realms. Can't we just deal with our problems and not send them elsewhere? This was a solution of the time, not one of the current. Clearly. The host came upon a great gateway different from Sailmark. This city had no greater perimeter wall, and Sailmark had no large gateway such as this. The host halted. Ruach pushed his stag forward, moving into the infantry before him. He pulled out a silver horn that was different from that of his other horn he had used. With pursed lips, he sounded a long song that started low and increased in volume. At first, it seemed nothing was happening, but then the gateway before them creaked and opened. 
A fail-safe, Lord Relia said. The vampire lords were given strict terms. If they ever returned to this land, they would not be allowed to remain in their city. Why give them a path to return? Aveam asked. There are some things we cannot prevent, for regardless of their creation or the formation of what was their god, they are not an unintelligent lot. The cunning of the vampire lords should not be underestimated. The gates were open. Ruach circled back with his stag, switching now to his elven horn. The greater host of stags were well near the gateway now, their forms moving into the rolling fogs that poured forth. Ruach sounded his horn, and the host moved with haste. The archons within their own host crafted wards high above them just as in the distance. The stag riders and their accompanying archons did the same. Rossi moved back into Avorn's robes, and the shadow elf gripped his staff tighter. As the host reached the gateway, there was a great shift in temperature. The air was ice cold. The sounds of the hooves of the stags became accented, and they felt extremely tired. More of the stags were suddenly in view, and flashes of light disoriented Evern. Screeches came, yet he could not see for a moment. Evern! Avium shouted. The shadow elf was on the hard brick of a roadway. Stags ran indiscriminately around as Avium stood just above him, casting a ward with one hand and knocking back large bat creatures with flashes of fire. Dead elves surrounded him. He pushed up, brandishing his staff and finding that most of the host struggled to stand up. It was a defensive spell. Most of the host was affected. Ruach stumbled about like a drunkard, chugging a red potion as he did. Bastards, he shouted out. From the skies above, more of the flying creatures swarmed down. They had two arms and two legs, with wings of a bat and pointed ears. Strange creatures, but entities that seemed afraid of fire and recoiled as Archons and Iavium used their spells. Ruach ran among the nearby elves, pulling them up to their feet. Though many had been affected, most of the Archons were well, having been shielded from the effects since they were the actual casters of the wards versus simply being under the ward. They expected this, Tush said. They were ready. I do not see they, Ruach said. Only these creatures. This was but a harsh reminder of the vileness of these creatures. Ruach sounded his horn again, and most of the host awoke and stood, only to stumble about. Arise, arise, elves of Varmark, blades at the ready. The elves were up, but many had already been bitten, screaming out. It was Ruach who went to them. Advance first! Your life is forfeit, but may you strike down our enemy in battle before you turn. These were fellow Fikmark elves. There was no sadness or hopelessness in their eyes. They looked at their captain, smiled, and lifted their swords. Not too soon, for as more of the white moon rose over the city, the screeches of the bat creatures gave way to the sounds of footfalls. The elves formed their lines as on either side of them, shadows moved within the city. Behind them, more elves rode into the gateway with rangers just behind them. The stags took position on the right flank, and Evern turned his eyes to the left. Demon men, those he had heard so much about, were before him, while wild and crazed creatures had attacked them before in the wilderness, and the bat-like creatures just now, these entities were different. Their forms were blanched, white, and their eyes glowed red. They had armor and dark capes that furled in the wind. These were not reawakened dead as he had seen with necromancy. These were not beasts. These were the unquestioning servants of the vampires of old, long, sleeping in the city for the time that was before them now. A single dark figure appeared on the grounds between the demon men and the elves. You of the western lands cannot prevent what is to come. Soon we will take full form. I am simply a messenger of those who come. Our queens have gathered their full strength. This city is but a vessel in which to travel. You will not stand. Archons, dispel this wretched being! 
The nearby Archons shot white blasts in a series of eruptions, striking the shadowy figure and catching it aflame. The figure vanished. The demon men beyond drew their weapons, large spears, swords, and most weapons they would have wielded when still alive. Screeches returned, the bat-like creatures flying down in a swarm. Elven and ranger arrows responded, followed by an ever-increasing blast of white light from the combined forms of the Archon's powers. Ruach leaped ahead in front of the holding line, in front of those already bitten he had commanded forward first. The elf captain of Fickmark did as King Suvasel would wish at this moment. Ahead of the support of Archons or the protection of the shield wall, he met the enemy blade first, and Avorn witnessed the fury of the Fickmark elves. By the time the battle line had reached the demon men, Ruach was surrounded but not disadvantaged. From his wand he sent balls of fire, and his blade gleamed in the moonlight. But there was no blood. As the lines met, it was the first time a true battle was fought between elves and demon men in hundreds of years. Elvish blades sang a song, but the flesh of their enemy was not like that of the living. The swords broke through that which was as tough leather, their blades already slowed by the armor of their adversaries. It was this reason the Archons around concentrated on flame-based attacks, warming up and melting the flesh of their enemy, allowing elven blades an easier time at striking the foe before them. Avium stayed close to Evern, sending her own dispel-style attacks that rendered the demon men into piles of flesh. Evern concentrated using fire, accenting the attacks of the Archons. He looked behind them and noticed that the host was advancing the opposite direction, the stag supported by another line of infantry. This was not how he had seen cavalry used in his lands, but the stag's large horns tore into the demon men, throwing them around and breaking any formation the enemy tried to maintain. Ruach fell back into the line, slashing in unison with his men as they began to curve through the blackened buildings of the city, clearing the main street and sending the first wave of demon men into retreat. Elves pursued them into the alleys, but then it was as if the shadows gripped them and the warriors vanished. Remain on the road under the protection of the Archon's light. We must reach the central tower. Do not break from our force. Elven horns sounded in the distance. Evern looked at Ruach. A signal, Ruach said. Our other host has made it to the first gateway. The gateway before them was coming up. This one was already broken down, and Ruach simply ran up the ruins, pulling out his own horn. He sounded several horn calls, and the host moved over the wreckage, descending the other side. Elves, you walk where your kin did upon our first attack, where your king fought beside the old elf kings, the heroes of the orc wars. Be proud this moment. Do not let our ancestors see you recoil in fear for fear is what we shall face. Evurn did not see what Ruach spoke of at first, but now he did. Before them, large specters of shadow rose up over the hosts of demon men, pouring forth from another large gateway up several tiers of stairs. The two elven hosts came together and turned in unison. The stags fell back, their riders dismounting and drawing back their arrows as the rangers did the same. Their enemy had the high ground, the ability for a swift and jumping attack to throw back the host in one swoop, but the Archons were prepared. Touche lifted his staff, summoning a large orb of fire, the other Archons doing the same. The elves chanted, their voices lifting praises to Aether and the moon and the stars in their own tongues. Evorn could make out some of the words, but the verses themselves were convoluted by the sounds of battle, but it seemed just the mentioning of the goddess spurred a reaction. The demon men gripped their ears, the sounds of praise deafening to them. Their forms were unable to hear the high praise to the gods of the north, the voices of the elves causing them to flail in pain. The large specters of shadows reached over the host of the Varmark woodlands, but the conceived spell of the Archons had reached a pinnacle. 
The blast of fire was like daylight, striking upon the grand stairwells and engulfing the demon men in arcane flame. The elves advanced, scaling the stairwell through the flames and slashing back their foes. As the light of the spell gave way, Evern saw that the gateway had been fractured by the elven spell. Still, Ruach sounded the silver horn, and the gateway opened even as its rocky form fell away, crumbling. The specters that haunted above them retreated once again, this time into the shadows of the mountains high above them. This area was like a large courtyard, open with large towers some distance away, that which could be described as a large fountain with a single standing statue at its center was the only structure that was not along the wall of buildings and towers in the mountain itself. The host spread out as Ruach approached the large statue. Evern pointed at it. The statue has the marks of a god, but I do not recognize its form. That is Elriasona, the first vampire of the demigod. He once had a throne built upon this place. This is where his form was given life, but I do not worry about a dead wretch such as that. There are enough hauntings still within this place. He turned to Richt. The nodule, which tower is it within? We must assure it has not been activated. Richt closed his eyes. He seemed to quiver, his entire body shaking at once. Focus. I struggle to... Focus. A VM touched his head, and his eyes jerked open. He looked at her and for a moment her eyes flashed white. The Dwemhar powers are strong within you, child. I see clearly like it is before us even now. Such paths converge onto this one. I see death come soon. But for the host before us or the host that swarms in from the dark places around us, I cannot say. That which we seek is before us. But that which is shrouded must be defeated. Richt forced Aviam's hand from his head. Thank you, but I cannot use your power for too long. It is dangerous for both of us, since I should in no way still have a connection. Richt paused, staring at Aviam. I saw a glimpse of your past, the past you do not know yet. You will soon learn more of your mother. Your eyes will be open to a greater truth. Avorn looked to Aviam, who did not respond to Richt. I do not understand said Ruach. That which is shrouded? What trickery is this? No trick! A voice thundered down. The black shadows from the mountains converged with shadows, reaching up from the entire city, taking form upon the statue of Elria Sona itself. The statue took form, glowing with a bright red fire. The host backed away, arrows flying but doing no damage to its form, Mage fire striking the stone, but not slowing the evil before them. Black moon approaches, the form shouted out. Reckoning comes upon the land. I open the way for my servants to awaken that which has slept. These lands will become as blight. So I speak it, so it is. The statue did not move to strike at the host, but instead went back to where it was standing, smashing the platform, the fountain-like construct, over and over. A passage with glowing torches of green fire emerged. The statue turned back, looking at the host. The way is open, made for my servants to bring about the end of the elves. I have made it so, and now I will remove what stands in their way. The statue that was aflame before now appeared as sheen stone. In its hands were floating shards of obsidian, and upon its head it wore a silver crown. Arrows bounced off its form. The blasts of arcane fire did nothing to it. In large swaths of its hands, it flung shards of obsidian at will, striking many of the elves and rangers who could do nothing to stop it. Ruach ran forward with Tausch and several other elves. Tush managed to blow off a chunk of its stony form, but it did not slow the statue. Two more elves fell to the shards of obsidian before Ruach's blade made contact, brushing along the stone, creating sparks but nothing else. Ruach slid under the creature, attempting to strike from behind. The statue swung toward him, forcing him to flip and the statue to just barely miss. 
ever knew fire would not work. He cast his earth magic at the ground, but nothing happened. Earth magic will not work upon this place of vampiric power, Tush said. As the statue targeted the host that fled to nearby structures and places they could hide from its attacks, the few who still tried to face down the statue struggled to land hits of any kind. A veum floated high above the statue, summoning a large spear of Dwemhar energies. The statue glanced upward. A Dwemhar! I love Dwemhar! Cover her! Ruach shouted out. The statue threw its obsidian shards, but several archons sent static wards just beneath Evium. Evorn ran forward, knowing his earth magic would not work, but sending blasts of arcane energy at the statue's legs, causing it to stumble and turning its attention from Evium, even if for a moment. Swirls of white twirled around the Enchantress as her attack grew and her Dwemhar energy surged. The statue spun in place, sending shards in all directions and forcing back the Archons protecting Evium as well as Ruik and Evern. It glared at Evium. My dear Dwemhar, let me have but a taste of your blood. The statue leaped upward, reaching for Evium just as she opened her eyes and sent the blade of energy down upon its form. In a blinding flash, the statue was shattered sending a blast of shards in all directions. Avern shielded himself with a hasty ward, and when the pelting subsided, he ran quickly to the rubble before them. Ruach did the same, pulling shards from his forearm and running atop the statue's pieces to assure no sign of magical life remained. Avium was spent, having summoned possibly more energy than was actually required to take down the enchanted stone, but successfully doing so. An archon came to their side and tipped a blue potion into her mouth, an elixir for both health and to restore her powers. She took the vial, clearly feeling a bit better than before, and chugged the remainder. Careful, Evern said. Valrin will not like it if I do not bring you back with me. Thankfully, I do not see any other statues. She laughed. Ruach was standing above them. Good work, Evium. Ruach and Richt investigated the passageway. Richt ran ahead, and Ivorn, Ivium, Ruach, and Teush ran to follow him. At the end of a long hallway lit with green torches every few paces, there was a single black orb sitting on a large white pedestal. This is it. Once a Dwemhar device, it is now something else entirely. If the demon men or the vampires reach this, Blight, a sudden sickness of the earth, will strike this land. Blight will destroy our homeland, Ruak said. Lord Relia and several other elves entered the chasm. Forward watches report movement in the far woods. Wait, is that it? Is that what they seek? He asked, looking at the orb. Yes, Ruak drew his blade and pointed at the end of the passageway. They do not cross that threshold. Purification stones shall be laid by the pedestal, at the fore of the passage, and on the stairwells advancing upward. Richt, I wish for you to attempt to command the demon men who are purified. If we can turn them against the enemy, that is what we shall do. Ruach went back up to the courtyard. Casualties? One of the Fickmark captains came to his side. We have lost one hundred of our kin, several stags. The rangers have lost twenty of their brothers, as best we can tell. Several rangers moved back down to the gateways and lit torches to signal us of approach. Avor noticed there were several torches now at either gate, leading to the stairwell and further down at the main gates. The entire city was built on a gentle slope that although it gave a clear line of sight from the courtyard and the towers down to the fields below, the darkness of the night made seeing anything difficult. For this to be a sister city of Sailmark, it was a strange setup, yet without the trees surrounding Sailmark, perhaps it would look a bit more like this. Cast mage light, Ruak said. We must gain sight of the fields. Tush lifted his staff and sent a blast of white fire over the city. 
The orb of shimmering energy flew until over the fields, and in several sparks grew greatly in size, appearing as a sun for a few moments. The field looked as if it were alive itself. The vast amount of movement signified that there would be no sleep this night, not that any present expected it. By the grace of Ether, Tush said, the enemy comes upon us. Pull back the rangers. Keep them where they are, Ruak said. There is no safe space. We are alone. He turned to the others in the courtyard. Several had climbed atop the buildings. Others formed up along the stairwells. All stared at the dimming mage light and the coming tides of the enemy. Ruach lifted his blade and wand together. We are alone. We stand against the darkness as the elves of Fickmark, the rangers of the Riverlands, and the elves of Sailmark. We shall not give this ground. None of the alliance of the vampire shall make it within this courtyard and continue living. As long as we draw breath, we will hold. Archons of the Varmark Woodlands, may your mage light be as torches to burn away the darkness that rolls over us. Ever noticed that as he said this, dark fogs billowed over the walls around them. But a sample of the buffet to come. He laughed. The fogs were not of the kind that one would see before the dawn in the lower riverlands or high between the mountains where clouds gathered with changes of temperature. The fog was much thicker, almost as smoke. Avorn could barely see beyond the reach of his staff. The winds, which had been still, increased, blowing west, the fogs rolling further over them. Lights burst from the city, as not only did mage fire burn upward high into the sky, revealing how deep the fogs were, but it seemed the city itself was coming alive. Green fires erupted in braziers long dormant behind them. So it begins, Lord Relia said. The formation guarding the way to the nodule of power that the vampire sought were made up of many hundreds of archers in formation along the stairwells. The stags were at the flanks, what little there were, their riders holding large spears like the many spikes on the back of a dragon. Beyond all of them, the archons gathered in a large orb, sending multiple large waves of brilliant fire. Even Evium was wide-eyed, but it was not in mere amazement that she stared or kept focus. As the spells flew high into sky, bringing enough light akin to dawn or dusk over the city, thousands of flying beasts moving from the darkness around the city dove for the formations on the great stairs. Elves of Ether, give the goddess your arrows! Ruach shouted. The elves elevated their bows in unison, and with a near-silent release, hundreds of bolts sang with a whistle in their feathers in an arc, striking the creatures above. Ranger horns sounded across the city. They're at the gates, Ruach said. Elves, our time is nigh. The elves shot volley after volley into the sky, knocking many of the flying beasts back. Several made it through, and the mage lights turned to spells of electricity that shot across the low clouds as if a thunderstorm were upon them. The beasts fell upon the city, and the lines of defenders alike, their corpses still twitching and charred from the arcane attacks. The rangers who had survived thus far moved up the stairwell. Several of them bled, and at least one had bites along his neck. Evorn stared at this man in particular. Though his fellow rangers tended to his wounds, putting bandages on his arms, the man began to snarl and hiss. In a sudden shift, the man reached out, grabbing hold of one of his kin. His skin was blackened where before, red blood ran free, his body was blanched. Traff! Traff! Stop! One of the rangers shouted. Ruach leaped from his stag and thrust his blade into the man's throat. The rangers were to their feet with their blades pointed at Ruach. I told you that those who were bitten would turn. I put my own kin at the front of our advancing lines that went into the city. I am not what you attempt to make me in your moment of pain. There is plenty of time yet. Perhaps you can do the service yourself if I suffer a bite. The rangers bowed, backing away, showing a level of respect that Evern had not seen one of the race of men ever show an elf. 
the torches within the city and the few rangers who had stayed behind, were extinguished. More braziers of green fire erupted to life, and the city itself seemed to be shifting from the shadows along the walls. Another wave of fog rolled through them, and a frigid cold came with it. Richt walked to the front of the line, throwing down his own device bringing forth his purified ones. The elves in the near vicinity recoiled and aimed their bows. Hold! Ruach shouted out. Richt went to the purified ones. You can make those who have hunted us see we are a friend. More devices like what changed us to this form exist, Richt said. The rather strange mental state of the purified ones made even simple commands a bit more difficult, seeing as even at this moment, Evern saw one of Rick's minions as they were, wandering off. There will be others. They will come. They will be transformed into us. We must show them their enemy. We must kill all who are of the alliance to the bloodsuckers. Several of the purified ones seemed to understand. Richt looked to Ruach. I normally do not keep them contained for so long. Their minds are foggy, but they clear. Good, Ruach said. We indeed have enough fog already. The lower grounds of the Great Stairs, the expanse from the two gateways that was just in sight, burst into white flames. The first of the demon men flailed their way through, several elvish arrows striking down the first of the attackers. Spells of ice flew from the darkness, demon men priests, or so they were known at one time, extinguishing one of the few substances that all in alignment with the vampire lords feared. The Archons released their spells of light just as hundreds of the demon men swarmed the lower level. This flash seemed to stun them. The creatures recoiled, shaking. A harsh horn from beyond the gates rallied them in some form, and with a wave of fog they pushed forward. A volley of arrow fire met them as they stepped upon the stairwell. Again! Release! Ruach shouted out. From the skies came another wave of flying creatures. Evium clapped her hands together and flew just above the elven lines. She looked up at the clouds, her eyes burning white. She reached behind herself, summoning her powers, pulling loose stones and fragments of buildings into an undulating ball of energy. Then came a snap in the air, and she released her attack above her head, sending fragments in a blast that splattered into the wave of attackers. The demon men pushed up the great stairwell even as volleys of arrows slammed into them and spells tore apart their forms. But still, though their position was fully engaged, Ruach did not come down from his high place. The elf captain twirled his blade, and though as hopeless as it already seemed this far from dawn, it seemed the arrow fire increased, and stags on the edges of the lines advanced and returned to their positions, having knocked back the creatures even further. Piles of their enemy built up on the lower levels. Demon men priests lined up, using those around them as shields as several more of their kind took positions. Winds wrapped along the lower level, snaps of summoned ice gathering in one large volley. The Archon Tush lifted his staff toward the heavens, and the starlight above drowned out by the heavy fogs. Etha, open the way of the heavens! Bring fire upon this city through my staff! I pray to thee now! Fire cracked high above in the night sky, just as the icy spells from demon priests struck the upper reaches of the stairwell, bringing down both elf and man. Tusha's prayers were answered in hellfire raining from the sky. Thunder crackled and stones of fire engulfed the front ranks all the way out across the city. Tush fell to his knees and Ruach dismounted, pulling up his companion. The goddess answers you. Take leave, friend, to the rear of the line. Ruach pointed to another archon. Tend to your master. Give him potion and rest. Now, let your turned brothers and sisters know their enemy, Rick suddenly shouted out. The demon men reached the purification stones, and in snaps of white, the vile forms that were there for one moment were replaced by the confused entities that were purified ones. The already turned ones ran past them, 
jumping into the demon priests and tearing them apart. The elven volleys, which before were concentrated on the approaching wave, were directed a bit higher, leaving still more room for demon men to be purified and Rick's forces to augment. The glow of the fire from Tiusha's prayer grew brighter and the fogs were burned away. It was at this moment Evern saw that atop the buildings in the distance, the many shadowy figures like before in the woods when they were attacked watched over their demonic minions. Even now, several of them were breaking off, moving along the edges of the attack and out of the immediate view of now even Ruach, who had seen them. They mean to flank us, Evern said. Ruach pulled Evern away, and Avium followed. The elf captain moved quickly away from the defensive line. I have made a tactical error this night. There is a path to the south of us. There, a beast sleeps, and it was only upon seeing those shadows move in that direction that my mind remembered such a thought. A beast? Avium asked. A vampire warden. Large creatures beyond the fodder we fight here. To just the southern path? What of the north? I do not know for sure. I shall send my own warriors that way, but I cannot spare many from the fight at hand. You two, you come from the north, and no doubt have dealt with creatures of all kinds. I entrust you with the task of pacifying the warden. Get there before them, open its stony vault, and burn it from existence. Ruach left them. Damn, 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 creatures of the forsaken realms, Evern said. Come now, Evern, let us find this creature. Between the two of us it shall be no match. Evorn coughed. Your father made such a claim. That went over well. But you didn't die. Avium smiled. The two of them ran to the southern edge of the courtyard, and beyond a large brick enclosure, they found a small passage and a gateway that unless one was looking for it, it would not be present. A VM pressed against the gate, and with a blast of magic it gave way. Their path was open to them, and what lay beyond the darkness, neither of them knew. The sounds of battle did not cease, but it did become muffled. The path they followed snaked downward, only lit every few paces by smaller green torches, it was actually an alleyway with several doors that they passed through. The gnarled roots of dead trees poking their skeletal tops from the crevice nearly blocked their path on several occasions. At this point, Rossi jumped from Evern and slithered along an overhanging eave just above them. Don't try to get out of this, Rossi. We need every spell and fang we have. The snake moved with haste out of view, and then shot itself across the chasm above, moving into the darkness. As the path opened further, they paused, seeing a large pool of dark water and a slab of glowing stone in the mountain itself. There was cryptic writing along the center of the slab that was much brighter than the stone around it. Old tongue of the world, a common speech. Before the race of men was birthed upon the plains, this was written by the demigod, it is the only way. What does it say? That Rasi was the smart one of the three of us. This is no vampire. This is something else. The wind shifted around them, and that which was shadowy around them seemed to become fluid. Evern and Avium were back to back. Avium summoned white fire in her hands, and Evern's staff glowed orange. Brave strangers to these lands. A voice spoke as if all around them. You come here, yet I question your purpose, for you are not of the elven kin of these lands and do not seem to have stake here. What is your purpose? We do not allow evils of the old world to take form in this one, Avium shouted. The shadows converged on the ground before them. Neither do I, the voice figure said. Evern pointed his staff at the person before them. It was a male figure. His hair was white and long, and his most prominent feature was the large red jewel he wore on a necklace hanging from his neck. I, too, do not wish the old evils to return, the vampire said, pacing before them. It is why we come back to this land, to purge that which disrupted our lives before. 
Already one foe is vanquished. The Dwemhar are no more. They were vile, a foolish people, and no better than their elven friends. Tell me, how long do you feel this pathetic defense can keep up the barrage? We bring with us two legions, and more shall come with the activation of the portal. What then? What then will the elves do? Aveam leaped toward their adversary, casting her white Dwemar energies at the figure, engulfing it in flames. The figure vanished and appeared again high above them, cackling. Dwemhar? I had believed they were all destroyed. Most, Evern said. Dwemhar are not all you must fear. The shadow elf shot fire at the vampire, who spun and deflected the spell just as several shards of ice hit him from the other side. Avium floated nearly to his level. The vampire lunged, landing feet first in Avium's side, throwing her against the mountainside. Evern ran to where she was, keeping his staff up. The vampire dropped to the ground, fangs glistening. I much like the taste of Dwemhar blood. Do not bother, Evern hissed. She is but part. Evern slammed his staff. A wall of fire erupted around them, shielding them from the vampire for a moment. Evium was bleeding but able to stand. Ice darkened the flames, and Evern turned to see the vampire walking through what remained of his spell. He swung his staff, knocking the vampire back. The vampire dug into the ground, slowing his momentum before charging again at Evern. Evern spun, moving out of his way as Evium reached out, sending bolts of electricity into the creature. The vampire vanished again, appearing high above them. Time was not wasted. The glowing slab split. A doorway hidden behind the magic of the runes opened. You but delay your failure. Why fight that which cannot be defeated? Let this duel be a premonition for you. You cannot fight that which is stronger. Rossi, the serpent of Avorn, emerged just behind the vampire. In an instant, its strike hit the vampire in the back of its leg. The attack caught him off guard. He attempted to return to the shadows to flee, and instead rematerialized, having dragged Rossi off the side of the upper level. The vampire fell to the ground, and before Rossi was kicked from his leg, Evorn slapped the head of his staff into the vampire's chest, sending a wave of undulating flames over his body. Not only was the arcane attack successful, Evorn managed to smash the jewel he wore. Though Rossi's poison had no effect on the creature as Evorn had hoped for a moment, he knew that significant power was within the necklace the vampire wore. The vampire charred from the flames, and a great amount of energy flew from the vampire into the pool before them. It is as a moon pool of the elves, Aviam said. The vampire was dead. Its blackened form blew away from gusts of wind that blew down upon them. But the doorway to whatever was locked away, the vampire warden, as Ruach had called it, was before them. Aviam reached into the pool. What are you doing? Evorn asked. Just a bit, just a bit, she said. Green fire engulfed her hand and she withdrew, but not out of pain. She closed her eyes, focusing her Dwemar energies in her other hand. Evern noticed her magic seemed to darken, and where before was white fire, it had become gray. I can feel the vibrations of the magic that is different from our world, the energy these beasts use. I can make my own powers align further against them. They are still not completely within our world. My magic only has so much of an effect. For now, this will greatly increase the lethality of my spells against those of their realm. But what was coming was not fully of their realm or their adversaries. Avern peered into the great darkness before them, unsure of what clawed its way from the bowels of the mountains. A wretched odor came upon them, and their eyes watered. The smell burned their nostrils. Evern lifted his staff, summoning flames as his companion did the same. In unison, they released the attack, and the fire entered the darkness, only to vanish. This is supposedly a vampire warden. Vampire? 
a voice thundered. I am no vampire! Multiple arms, elongated, ghastly forms, reached out from the darkness. The hands had silver nails and purple markings that ran up and down the arms. I am not of the reawakened dead, not of blood magic. I am older than such, and not a warden, but a true master. The multi-armed form pushed itself out of its dark hideaway like a large spider from its nest. This was no form that either Evorn had seen or Evium had read about. It had at least twelve arms, but the speed in which its arms reached up and over them made it difficult to see. The arms had a mass of shadows that rode the back of the many arms like baggage upon the back of a horse. The arms themselves gripped into the rocks of the mountains and suspended the shadowy form high above them. Ever knew he could not use his vine magic, but there were other powers of the earth. He slammed his staff down, sending ripples of energy up and through the stones around them, creating small cracks in the stones themselves. Rocks flew up, and as he spun in place, he sent several larger stones at the creature itself. The creature fell partially down. Evium summoned lightning within her hands, casting it at the creature and attempting to curve her spell enough to pull it down. The creature made a sound like that of a horn call and a hiss before its arms catapulted it up, and with the many silver-clawed hands, it pounded the grounds where Evern and Evium stood. The two of them cowered, beaten down by the creature and using their spells to avoid being struck directly. The many arms were attacking so quickly that neither of them had time to avoid the strikes. They both crawled under the cover of large rock faces on either side, simply leaving the creature above them unchallenged. Blight times come. I shall feed then. I must prepare. I must devour. Evorn peered out, noticing that the many hands of the creature were vanishing. He stuck his head out, nearly getting slapped by one of the last hands, but the creature was well out of the ravine where they were meant to contain it and destroy it as charged by Ruach. The creature climbed toward the great towers of the city, pulling itself up to the pinnacle of the largest tower and setting its shadowy mass at the very center. The many arms reached out and gripped the mountainside. At that moment, the moon darkened. It seemed for a moment that only wisps of darkness rolled over the city, further veiling their sight, but as they pushed themselves out from hiding, the moon itself turned black. We are losing this fight, Aviam said. No matter what we have done, it has only acted as a temporary fix. Volleys of flaming arrows, lit by arcane yellow fire enchanted by the elven archons, struck the many arms, but the purpose of this strange beast was not to fight. The vampire lords made a calculated move, and there was nothing Ruach and the others could do about it. Fogs rolled through the ravine. Avern looked up to the top of the cliffs and saw the flying creatures landing high above them. We must return to Ruach, he said, and hope that we can hold until morning. Part 5. The Rogue and the Ruses Bry and Kirla watched as the Ayla sunrise departed the port. For Bry, it was strange to watch the ship leave without her, but for Kirla, she didn't care. Come, Bry. We must head to the tavern. From there we'll sort out who will be chosen for the nightly games. They began into the village. The buildings were tightly packed, and recent rains had turned the dirt roads into a muddy mess. There were many storefronts here with supplies of every kind, from metal workshops making horseshoes, nails, and hammers, to a large amount of mining and forestry supplies. The town was a growing place, with many taking jobs for the crown of Taria to further build up the kingdom. Are you positive he will seek company this night? I and my companions were watching this for some time. I lived it for a bit, but I can tell you I was a favorite for my dark hair, a rare quality in this region. I will stand out to the choosers, but they themselves change quite frequently. Picking the wrong women result in beheadings if done more than twice. He will seek comfort this night as ever. They will take any women they can, but at worst, he takes only me. Then, you'll have to find your own way. You won't be alone, 
Bry said. That's not how the crew works. I am not the crew. I am a rogue. But I thank you. I really do. They moved down one of the streets off the main one, taking a road leading out of the town, but a cart full of ale seemed to be going this way. They'd follow the ale. Their guess was right. While they made a few more turns and went back to the west a good bit, they did come to a large two-story tavern. Curla looked up at the windows. I had heard they had a new place here. The old tavern was by the water. This one is just right for what it really is. What it really is? Curla glared at Bry. Be happy a woman of your beauty and naivete is on a ship and far from here. You'd been taken as soon as I was. There are girls braver than I who did not escape. I do this for the ones who are trapped. Come, stick close. Don't talk too much. They like that. Kirla rolled her eyes, and Bry followed her into the tavern. The place was quite slow at the moment. Entering through the large door, they spotted the barkeep and a few men sitting at a nearby table having lunch. There was a large stage and a fireplace, as well as quite a few mounted troll heads on the back wall. A stairwell led to the upstairs, but it was roped off, and a sleeping man nearly falling off a stool guarded the way up. Can I help you ladies with something? The barkeep asked. Nothing, said Curla. She walked over to the bar with a sway that Bry knew was more exaggerated than normal. Curla leaned over the bar, having tucked their weapons out of sight. It was weapons of a different kind she chose to use on this man. My sister and I have come from a farm to the far north. We seek to work for the king. Is he hiring? I don't know what you're talking about. This is a fine business of ales and wines. Then who owns this place? I was told they don't just let weak peasants do what we wish to. Perhaps I can speak with them. A woman emerged from a stairwell that led to the basement, a small doorway in a recessed area that Kurla and Bry had not seen before now. I see you are a fiery one, but your sister must be dull. That is fine. There is work to be had. You are fortunate. I am here. You? Kurla asked. Bry stared at the woman in front of them. She was quite tall, with long blonde hair. I am Aslay, mistress of this tavern. I know what you seek, and this dimwit is not worth what you flatter him with. She walked over to Curla and stared at her chest before looking to Bry. The dull one, does she speak and have such showing qualifications? She is dim, Curla said. She would not be useful but to watch. But she is related, and I have heard that the king likes such things. Asli looked at those around, before nodding for them both to follow. She led them to the stairwell guarded by the sleeping man and slapped him awake. Why do I pay you? To sleep? Useless. As Bry followed Kurla and Asli, she questioned what she was getting into. She was not used to being put in such a role as the silent and do-nothing type, but perhaps in this situation it indeed was best. They proceeded down a dark corridor with very little light and only a few candles. There were multiple doorways and a seating area, with yet another stage-like setup and a darkened fireplace. The others have already been inspected. They are of poor quality. I hope you can be better. Normally, a servant of the king comes to check our quality, but as it is, I have few I could find. You two are more beautiful than I could expect to find in the riffraff of this town. I am surprised the king's men didn't find you sooner. Bry noticed that Curla made a point to take a deep breath. Her anger was just on the tip of her tongue, and thankfully, Aslai was looking away when she spoke, rummaging through the contents of a barrel to find more candles. They will be here at dusk. As it stands, you will go with one other. An elf, if you can imagine one who actually came this close. She is beautiful, but scarred. A warrior or something. I do not care. I make money. That is all I care of. A sleigh went about lighting the different candles at random. I have work to do. 
If you wish to enter into this life, simply go to the room to the right, the first one you come to leaving this room. Take off your cloaks. Assure your assets are clearly and seductively presented using whatever form of dress you find in the closet within. Do not come out until I come get you. Kirlo went toward the room and Bry followed. She glanced at the headmistress but did not stare. The woman seemed more than busy preparing the sitting area. As they entered the smaller room, Kurla shut the door. I remember her, but she does not me, obviously, Kurla whispered. She is nothing as she was before. She is beyond broken, another one lost to this life. She was like you? No, but she fought. She refused to let this life become something she did not rise above. But she started using mushrooms and more ale than a dwarf could drink to forget as much as she could. She is too deep. She is another I do this for. Curla ripped through the closet in front of them. She had no intention of removing what weapons she had, but she stripped down, putting on a long red dress that her chest more than filled out. Bry found something similar, but not near as risque. I see who has the experience here, Curla said. Bry was uncomfortable, but she absolutely was fine with finding her own way, if not chosen, as it were. Um, Curla took her throwing knives and wrapped the belt holding them around her lower chest. I will not be without a weapon again. But if they find those weapons... They won't check us here. They'll check us once we're at the castle. But by then, it'll be too late. Do you think you can get to the kitchen that quickly? Curla lay down on the bed and closed her eyes. I can do what I intend to do quickly. Bry wasn't sure what Curla meant, but now she was questioning the entire plan. Evening came. It was not quite night yet, but looking out the small window in the room, Bry saw that the sun was almost down. On the other side of the door, Bry could hear footfalls, and Curla sat up. It is time, she said. While they both stood there, Bry heard Aslai greeting them. Yes, I have three total that I think you'll be interested in. A door opened nearby. Come now, if you ever wish to see trees again, you'll mind. The voice that spoke was harsh and gruff. Where are the other two? Here, Aslai said. Bry swallowed her spit and tightened her fists. Curla stepped between her and the door. As it opened, she smiled and dipped in a bow. Sir, what can I provide for you? The man was partially disfigured. He had one eye that looked swollen, but not of any new injury. A heavy amount of scarring ran up the side of his face. He smelled of old ale, and though he wore heavy plate armor, he looked as if he had not seen a battle in twenty years. He stared at both of them and smiled at Curla. He prefers dark hair. Perfect. The king shall be quite happy with this acquisition, Aslay. What of the others I denied before? Destroyed. As ordered. Good. We'll take the elf and the blonde. That one there, he said, pointing to Bry. She would require more breaking than our king has time for. He is tired from his conquest and needs rest, not to teach. Get rid of her. Aslay bowed. Of course. Curla, come now. She pulled Curla from the room and slammed the door in Bry's face. Bry could breathe, taking a moment to collect herself. She slowed her breathing long enough to hear the interchange on the outside. You two will go with me to our king. You will please him as he wishes. Curla, you seem made for this. I am impressed. You are but a farm girl that we somehow missed in our raids. Interesting. And you? Another voice spoke, but she was very quiet. I am an elf. I know what you are, but I don't know how your type work. Have you experience, or shall I toss you with that other woman? I am married. A warrior elf of Selmark. He will have your head. Bry heard a sudden slap. Ha, not anymore. We'll have his head in time. Did you not hear? Sailmark took many losses recently. They came against Taria and were thrown down. Foolish elves. What is your name? 
Selby. It would be Selby, my lord. If you're not going to tempt me as Kirla, you must show more respect than you do. I know I'm not a tree or fluttering fairy, but I demand respect. You'll learn. Be happy you're an elf. Otherwise, I'd leave you. The king loves elves. We are done here, he said, beginning to walk. Make sure you acquire more like Kirla, and make sure to deal with that other one. As the sound of the footsteps trailed down the corridor and the stairwell, Bri heard someone at her door. She backed away, looking up at the window, but it was too small to climb out of. She backed to the far wall as the door opened. A sly opened it. She had a dagger in her hand. Now, she said, as it works of recent, those not chosen are not sent across the lands to other lords, for the king has revoked the lordship of many who have come against us. Your sister cared little for you. She seems to be of a different caliber than you, but that is fine. It is better this way. She will not be the same as she is now in a few weeks. In a few months, you will not recognize her. But you will not know any difference, young one. As Lai stopped just short of her. You are not afraid? You're a broken woman with no will of your own. I pity you. Pity me? I am your executioner, hardly broken. Bri lifted her hands, summoning ice at her fingertips, sending the serrated shards at Asli's neck. The woman collapsed, gasping. I am sorry, Bri said. Perhaps now you'll have freedom. Your king will soon be dead. The woman seemed to smile and then stopped gasping, her chest no longer rising. Bri took off the dress she had put on and returned to her other clothes. She ran down the corridor to the stairwell and noticed that the man guarding the way up was deep into a mug of ale. She moved with haste, slipping behind him and moving out the door as another customer came into the increasingly rowdy tavern. It was raining outside. She ran far from the tavern, happy for one that she had escaped such a place, but was now separated from Kirla. The worst part was she didn't think Kirla had any intent to open the kitchen door or any other door save the one that led to her target. Bri had to catch up with them, yet not be discovered. The king needs these shipments delivered tonight, she heard a voice shout. There was a cart full of random vegetables and other supplies nearby. We are trying. It already is night. He'll be asleep by the time I get there. Oh, come now. You know he pulls those all-night parties. I have word from the king himself that they plan to cook food all night. You need to get these to the king's kitchen staff or he'll send his rusies after you. The two men were just inside a small storehouse, and Bry was able to make it to the cart undetected. This cart was going exactly where she needed to go. She slipped over the side and pulled over a bag or two. The two men came to the side of the cart, and another few bags were loaded near her, but the man didn't look in. I'll hurry. The king will have his food. Good. Get moving. He climbed onto the cart, and Bry heard the snap of a whip before they were moving. She was where she needed to be with a hasty driver. Now she had to continue their mission and not let down her crew, and specifically, her captain. The rain was coming down in droves. Bry remained as still as she could, but took a moment to look up from the cart. They had been moving for some time, and beyond a small lamp near the side of the cart, it was very dark. Lightning flashed above. They went over a large bridge that seemed to span the ocean below, with two rocky cliffs at either side. Coming up to the other side, she saw men standing with torches under the cover of a small shack. The driver rode up to the shack, and Bry stayed as still as she could, praying that no one would see her. Heading to the castle? A voice asked. Yes, sir. The king's kitchen. A torch moved over the side of the cart. That is fine. Move along. This rain is horrendous. The driver's whip snapped again, and they were moving. Bry waited some time before looking up again. She could see the large, imposing stone walls ahead. The castle was massive, and from the looks of the many scaffolds and lifts nearby, it was still under construction. 
The cart followed along a waterway running out to sea and approached the town itself from the southwest side. The rain had slowed considerably, but not many people were out in the town, and the smell of smoldering wood from the douse torch basins helped cover up the stench of manure and other foul smells of the city. They proceeded through the city. The large gates on the outer wall closed behind them, and they approached another large gateway. This was the way to the castle. Bry kept lying back down to avoid being seen, so she did not get an overall good look at her surroundings, but it seemed this delivery was more than expected. Get that to the kitchen, a guard near the next gateway said. I am, I am. They rode into the inner keep. Bry spotted a large cathedral-like tower. This was it. This was the place they had to get to. The driver went around to the right and came to a large stone building. He exited the cart, and though several guards approached, they followed him. You're late! You can't be late! Bry popped up, scanning the surroundings. There was a stack of crates near several cows kept in a pen. She leaped from the cart and sprinted to cover. Now she had to get to the kitchen. She didn't know where Curla was, but she couldn't concern herself with that. Valrin and the others were waiting. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. The Ayla sunrise was tossed by the waves. They had reached the outskirts of the coast for some time and remained out of sight. Valrin had used the ship's powers to vanish from sight, and now, anchored offshore, they had waited from early afternoon until night. Both Evern and Fadis were happy the rain had stopped. Andok and Badur slept while they waited. Every and the elves had been meditating. One of the elves, Nikali, stopped meditating and stood by himself on the edge. Every noticed the elf was tearful, but did not approach. What of him? Fadis asked. His wife, taken. She was on a reconnaissance mission near Taria. He has not been the same since. You wouldn't believe it now, but he was the jokester of our group at one time. It is why I think he freely gave himself to this task. And you? Every looked away. The king was like my father. He watched after me, taught me to use a bow. I mean no disrespect to you, but he was there. Thoddis embraced his son. There is nothing you could say to me that I do not deserve. I am happy the king of the elves watched over you when I did not. Every returned the embrace. So, if you two are done hugging, Revla said, can you tell me of about when we should expect our way to be open? I and Bevelas have well stared down this place before us and do not see any passage near the water or otherwise. Bry and Kirla will not let us down, Valrin said. We just have to be patient. I am patient. I just worry of another storm or a ship running into us. Fadis looked toward the imposing fortress. It had grown considerably since he was in service to the king. But the strongest of fortresses always had a way to be brought down, and for now they watched for their Rusis and their rogue to provide that way. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. Bry had seen the supply driver come and go with supplies, and now he was riding away. The kitchen was a large structure with two floors. While there were guards near the front of the keep and the gateway to the outside, the only other guards she saw were atop the walls. Lightning caused her to jump at every flash. She could not go in by way of the doorway, but there were large windows that might have provided a way in. Bry sprinted from where she hid to the edge of the building. Some Rusis you are. You cannot even use that power. While powerful elementalists, Rusis also had the ability to turn invisible, a power she had never developed, having not been in positions before the last few years where she actively would develop it. It wasn't that she could not use it, but that she hadn't in so long even considered it. Tonight was not the best time, but she would try. She had to try. She closed her eyes, remembering the sensations she felt the one time she managed to do it, she hated the way it changed her vision, making it like she was looking at the world from underwater. Bry heard voices. She had nowhere to run. 
She focused her energies, releasing the tie to her aggressive powers and slipping from view as she saw herself begin to see the world as if she was looking up from beneath the surface of a clear pool. The two roving guards she had missed walked past her and stopped just nearby. One of them opened his trousers and relieved himself, sending urine rolling just near her. She remained still even as the urine ran under her boot. Did you see those girls? The one urinating asked the other. Yeah, I did. One was an elf. He'll have fun with that one. Doesn't he kill them now? Elves? Always. No, any of the girls. Isn't that part of it? Careful. You know how rumors are here. That's a way to get your head on the chopping block. He doesn't kill anyone. They fall from the walls. Horrible tragedies. The two men laughed and continued their patrol. Bry exhaled as she let down the veil hiding her from view, disgusted by both the urine she was standing in and the men around her. She waited for them to vanish around the corner and then looked back up to the windows. One was open. She glanced around to be sure that no one was watching and then ran along the edge of the building. There was one window open. It was on the far corner. There was a low overhang and a brace where the roof met the side of the building. She jumped, grasping it. She hung for a moment, staring into the inside of the building. There was a man inside, but he was busy cleaning several ducks and had his back to her. She began to swing her legs back and forth, working up momentum so she could swing herself for the opening. She had to hurry before the roving guards returned. She went for it, grasping the edge of the window and pulling herself up. There were multiple sacks of flour just beneath her. She jumped and moved against a large stone oven to her left. She peered around. Several more men had come into the kitchen. Finally, the cook said. These should have been here before sunset. The shipment was delayed due to the storms. The cook shouted out something unintelligible, and Bry heard dishes strike a nearby wall. Get out! Get out of my kitchen! You are literally the most worthless assistance I have ever had. I must get these ducks in the oven and prepare for the festivities. The king will not be happy if his favorite ducks are not perfect. Bry heard chopping again, and the yelling from before stopped. The cook threw several carcasses into a box not too far from where she was. Curla had said that scraps from the kitchen were thrown out to sea, and that was the door that was needed. For now, all she could do was wait. She watched as the pile of carcasses grew higher, and several assistants returned to the kitchen. She peered around the oven, still out of sight, but trying to gauge what was going on. The cook was busy cooking the duck, and assistants chopped and prepared a wild assortment of vegetables. Get wine out to the king. He and his concubines are ready. He likes them well plied even before dinner. He'd rather them pass out before eating than after, the cook said. I'd want to be passed out too if I was a concubine to the king, an assistant said. Another assistant laughed. That fat old lard must kidnap the girls. Is it really a concubine if they're kidnapped? The kitchen roared in laughter. Then a snap of heat surged through the kitchen. There was a loud bang. Are you rats done? A voice shouted. Yes, sir, the cook said. Bry looked around the edge. A man in dark robes stood in the kitchen. You burned me! You burned me! The assistant shouted. The robed man stomped forward, kicking the assistant in the face. That was nothing! The assistant reached out just as bolts of lightning flew from the robed man, surging into the assistant. Screaming ensued. The man quivered and shook as the bolts of magic surged through his body over and over. Blue and purple sparks leaped from him and against the wall. Then the attack stopped. The corpse that remained was but a charred shell. The robed man was a rusus, and a powerful one at that. Chef, your assistant's jokes of our king are not well accepted. He has paid your price for allowing this disillusionment in the kitchen. Do I need to speak to the king himself? Or can you keep your staff in line? No, sir. The king does not need to know. I can assure your dinner is coming with lots of wine and it will be tasty. No more insults from the kitchen. 
He deserves what he got. The strange Rusis reached over and stuck his hand into a pot. Duck sauce, quite tasty. You have a burnt mess in your kitchen. I'd get that out of here tonight. Perhaps the fish want it. The Rusis went to leave, but then stopped. I sense something. He began her way. She summoned her powers, but then focused. She couldn't attack him. That would ruin everything, and his level of power seemed much higher than hers anyway. She had to do it again. She closed her eyes, focusing, seeing herself fall beneath the water, and became absolutely still. The figure crossed in front of her, staring exactly where she was for a moment before glancing to her sides. His eyes were glowing. He had gauntlets that surged with light and seemed to feed into him with energy rolling off the edges. He was perfectly still for a moment and then jerked away. Rats have been eating your flour. You should throw that out too. Bri looked down at one of the sacks of flour and saw that her foot had torn it as she jumped from the window. And close that window. You don't need rain messing up the rest of the flour. We're at war with the elves. We need to keep our supplies up. Bri watched the man leave this time. She was still shrouded and moved quickly across the kitchen to another dark corner. There was a door this way, a door with a lock. Move the body, the cook shouted. We must get the food and drink out. Afterward, we dispose of all the trash, especially that body. She just had to wait. Music played for the longest time, and the roars of laughter from the king and his guests were the strangest backdrop for Bri as she sat motionless in the darkness. Given everything, she was happy she had used her powers again and beyond just standing still. She was able to move while under the shroud. She questioned who the other Rusis was. He had a level of power she had only ever read of back on her first ship, the truest bliss. The gauntlets he wore. She knew of a story, of a powerful Rusis with gauntlets that embedded power within their wearer. It was said that the wielder of such devices could use their powers without tiring. But those were lost, or so the story went. As she pondered of the gauntlets, the kitchen staff returned. They had a bottle of wine, and the cook made a point to chug several swallows before passing it off. The king retires, and we still live. He pointed at one of the men. You deal with him. Put him out at sea with the rest of the carcasses. Sir? What? He... he deserves better. A grave. A proper grave. His grave is the sea. The king will kill each of us if we do not abide by his or the Rusi's word. Do you want to be thrown out next? The assistant was silent. Get on with it. Now or I'll tell the Rusas myself that you cannot be trusted. He'll make sure your daughters are well taken care of by the king. The assistant shook his head. What is wrong with you? What is wrong with me? The chef shouted. The same as everyone, but you do not see me moping about. I do my job. I serve my king. You do yours, or you'll be sorry. That is how it is here. Do not like it? Throw yourself to sea. Bry backed out of the way of the door as the assistant dragged the charred body of their co-worker. He was sobbing. The chef wasn't just a fool as Curla had said. He was ruthless, perhaps due to something the king had threatened or already did, but he was not better than the king in the treatment of his people. As the man reached the doorway, he laid the body down on the ground and went back toward the cook. The key, he said. The cook pulled a necklace off and tossed the key to him. He caught it and went to the door. Unlocking it, he dragged the body into another room that smelled of rotten animal waste. The man then went to another door, opening it up with a forced push. The sudden gusts of northern winds caused the cook to shout, Shut the inner door! Bry looked. The man dragging the body was already out the second door and sobbing. Bry slipped down and pulled the first door closed. The man did not notice, and the cook didn't see her. 
She knelt in the rotting filth of what could only be described as a room of trash. The man knelt and placed his hand on the head of his obvious friend. I am sorry. I am sorry it came to this. We should have done what you said. We should have poisoned him. I am so sorry, my brother. The man suddenly looked behind him, seeing Bry, who made a motion for him to be quiet. You are one of the Rusis. You have been sent to kill me. He drew a small kitchen knife. Leave me. Let me have time with my brother. He... he was just married. I must tell his wife of him. Please, do not kill me yet. I am not here to kill you, Bry said. With the northern winds gusting upon them, leaves flew down onto the small ocean pathway of a ramp leading down to the waters. Every and the other elves appeared, their faces veiled, their blades glinting in the starlight. Elves, here? Every went to cut down the man, but Bry flashed her magic. No, he is not our enemy. Our enemy is within. The kitchen is just behind. Bry now saw the outline of the Ayla Sunrise stationery below. Valrin, Andok, Badur, and Fadis ran up the pathway. Good work, Valrin said. Where is Kurla? Fadis asked. She went alone. She plans to do it herself. The man from the kitchen stuttered. You, you, elves and people, you want to kill us all because of the war. No, just one, Fadis said, and whoever gets in the way. Spare my friend inside the kitchen, but watch for the cook. He has a sword. So do we, Valrin said. Stay with your brother, Bry said. Wait until you know it is clear. Then do what you wish with his body, as it will soon be no tyrannical king who rules this place. He has had his last meal. Part 6. In the King's Bedchamber The elves stacked up on the outer door to the kitchen. The stench around them of rotting vegetables, cheeses, and discarded animal parts did nothing to dissuade their advance, though Fadis wished he had a mouth covering like the elves. Andok and Badur has their bows in hand, and were watching the door they had came through before. The actual kitchen is up a small stairwell, and to the left past this door, Bry said. The large man is the cook. He has a weapon, but the amount of wine he's been drinking will surely prevent him from being any threat. Every pulled out two small orbs. These mixtures will knock out those within the kitchen. Where do we go next? I came into the kitchen. I only know that on the southern end of the building is another door and a way to the king's hall. And we have no idea where Kirla is? Fadis asked. Beyond with the king, or so we have to assume. There is an elf too, a warrior or something. Every placed his hand on Nikeli. We do not know if it is her. If it is, I shall kill all who stand between me and my love. Our target is the king. Bevla stated. Then let us have our target. Also, Bry said, there is a Rusis here. We knew that, Valrin said. No, this Rusis is powerful, much more powerful than the others. Fadis put an arrow to string. We'll deal with it. Every looked to Nikeli. You and I go through the kitchen. Bevlas, Revlas, you two ascend the wall with the rangers. Secure the upper portion of the keep. Keep the guards silent. The two leaves used their powers to ascend the wall and were out of sight. Andok and Badur both looked at one another. Guess we'll do it the old-fashioned way. Both the rangers went back outside and tossed grappling hooks up the side of the wall. Fadis looked at his son. Now, Every said, as the wind. Every pulled open the doorway just a bit and glanced in. Fadis leaned in and saw two kitchen assistants and the cook. Every tossed in the orbs and shut the door. Fadis heard those inside coughing. Every and Nikeli drew their blades. For the king, Every said. They pulled the door open. The way was clear. They led the way, moving with haste through the open door and scanning their surroundings as they moved across the kitchen. 
Thadis and Valrin followed. Those who had been standing in the kitchen appeared to be sleeping. They stood at the far doorway. Every pushed it open. Two guards were on the far edge of the corridor. Every and Nikeli shifted into leaves, moving down the corridor and materializing with their blades angled into their opponents' throats. Both guards fell. Fadis moved in next, Valrin trailing behind. A door opened, and a guard immediately saw Every and Nikeli. He went to draw his sword when Fadis released his arrow. Three guards down. They moved down the corridor and came to an overlook to the king's hall. There were castle attendants cleaning up the mess from dinner service, and a few guards, but it seemed even the guards had indulged in their share of wine, now laughing exuberantly. The corridor went around the king's hall and to another passage and a stairwell. As they ascended, every came upon a guard descending. He thrusted his blade into his neck, and he and Nikeli jumped over his corpse. It nearly knocked Valrin down as it fell down the stairs. Keep up, Fadi said. Be careful. Evern will eat me if you die. I still think you should have stayed on the ship. Captain, Valrin teased. Quiet, every whispered down. The leaves of Sailmark looked at one another and held up six fingers. There were six guards up ahead. A door slammed open, and a booming voice shouted outward. Get away from me, you filth. Try to grab my sword. Every nodded and he and Every sprinted from the stairwell. Fadis came up and saw the two of them already toppling the guards in the middle of the hallway. Three more drew their swords at the far end. Fadis fired in rapid succession, sending three arrows toward the guards, two finding their targets and a third missing. The last guard lunged with a spear, attempting to stab Every. He spun, ducking from the thrust and throwing a dagger as he dropped low. The sixth guard fell. Around the corner from them was a large stairwell, unseen from the position they were in before, but evidently it went down to the throne room and up to an upper level. Nikeli moved upward with every just behind him. The same voice returned. Do what you want with this filth. I have one with golden hair. She won't try to stab me. She knows what to do with her hands. Fadis heard them laughing. The king is there. Kirla is with the king, Every said. He peeked over the edge, but Nikeli was already nearly over the void. There were three guards, each of them kicking at a figure on the floor. One of them lifted the figure. It was a female elf. Her chest was bare, and she had blood running down her face. We move forward. Take down the three. Move into the king's chamber, Every said. Move quickly, Fadis said. Kirla's fate will be the same as that other concubine if we are not careful. Nikeli was already in full view of the guards. He had taken off his mask, and his hands were trembling. Selby! he shouted out. The guards holding the elf laughed. Truly, she told us he would come for her. She wasn't lying. I see why he's here. She was beautiful, for an elf. Place her on the ground, Nikeli said. Sure. Every was up with Nikeli now. The guards laughed. Elves, sound the bells, lock down the keep, do as the elf says. The two guards holding Selby threw her off the ledge, and Nikeli turned to leaves, jumping off the ledge and grasping her body with his own. Every and Fadis moved forward. Arrows flew, and Every's blade cut into the nearest guard. Valrin charged as well, taking down another guard as Fadis turned his attention to guards on the lower level. The bells had not sounded yet, but at least two guards had seen Nikeli and Selby fall to the ground. Fadis took down both of them. The door exploded open, and the half-nude king ran for the doorway on the far hall, nearly knocking every over. Fadis released an arrow, catching the king in the back. Every sprinted and jumped, driving his blade into the back of the king's head. Kurla emerged from the room, kicking another man who looked just like the first one who had emerged. His face was bloodied. He has used shifters. These are not the king. Some type of magic, Kurla shouted. The king was here. 
he took a passage that sealed as I went for it. Every ran into the bedchamber of the king, and Fetus followed. The room was massive, with a large bed with ropes and blades hanging from the top of the chamber. What kind of king is this? Valrin asked. A bastard, Kirla said. Fadis saw the outline of the door, but the way was locked from the other side and was made to look like the brick of the wall. This is no good, Evry said. We cannot follow him. It's a dwarven door. There was shouting in the lower levels. Elven assassins! Elves in the king's chamber! Where does this lead? Fadis asked Kurla. I don't know. I never knew this passage. Fadis ran back to where the half-naked doppelganger was attempting to crawl away. He placed his sword at his neck. You, where has the king gone? The real king? I don't know. I really don't. The man shuddered. Every ran up and kicked him across the face. Tell us, now. I swear to not betray my king, no matter the threat of life or death. Fadis stomped him in the stomach and then put the tip of his sword at the man's bare crotch. Still? No, no, don't, please. Kirla kicked him in the stomach and then put her foot on Fadis's blade, pushing down. Blood ran over the castle floors. He is escaping! The lower levels! There is a place made for him! A place for him to escape from if the castle is threatened! A trio of guards had arrived from the lower level. Every tossed his daggers one after another, bringing each of them down. Curla went to one of the other guards and grabbed his sword. I know not where he speaks, but we must head down there. We must try to cut him off. Fadis looked down to Nikeli. He was up, holding his injured wife in his arms. He had his sword out at multiple foes encroaching upon them. Fadis released multiple arrows as they ran toward the lower level and away down to him. Every leaped over the side of the wall, driving his blade into two more guards of the dozen swarming the area. As Valrin and Fadis reached the lower level, a man with a golden helmet led a large contingent of guards into the king's chamber. Send for the ruses. Get them here now. Our king is under attack. Every sprinted forward, leaping sword first at this captain of the guard. The attack was parried, and every was forced off, just as Fadis landed an arrow in the captain's abdomen. Those drunk and stumbling guards who were sobering up from the fighting and bloodshed crawled away from the tabletops as the king's attendants hid in the corners of the room. Fadis looked at Nikeli and his wife. She gripped his sword arm and forced herself to stand. My love, let me help. These guards, especially that one, she said, pointing to the captain. They hurt me over and over. Nikeli grabbed a sword from a fallen guard and handed it to her. He kissed her on the cheek as he sprinted to the side of the room, jumping onto a pillar before twisting, turning to mere leaves and flying directly into the captain. Blood squirted from the captain's neck as the elven blade passed through the many vessels, nearly severing his head. The captain fell dead. Fadis, guards block the way to that doorway. Perhaps he is that way, Valrin said, pointing behind them. On the opposite end from where most of the guards were flowing in, six guards stood with their shields high and swords out. Every Nikeli, he pointed. Arrows flew from the higher places. At first, Fadis thought it was more of the king's men, but the elven arrows of Revlas and Bevlas found their marks on the guards cutting across the throne room. Andok and Badur were just beyond them, firing arrows down into the courtyard outside. Go! Revla shouted. No guard yet breathes in the courtyard, but they are coming through another way. We have a vantage point from here of both the inside of the keep and the gateway to the city. But none have come this way. Rangers in the city made contact. They will guard the lower level. Rangers? Fadis asked. Yes, several. Andok said they're rangers of the north. Just go. We will watch this way. Fadis looked to the guards at the doorway. 
He released several arrows before one finally landed. The man collapsed, but those around him did not reach for him. They locked shields again. Bry sent a bolt of lightning that struck the one in the center and sent the others against the wall. Every and Fadis charged them, striking down each. Fadis was nearly out of arrows, as it were, and it was good to hold his sword again. They went to open the door but could not force it. Move, Bry said. She focused her powers, sending a blast of fire at the door. Nothing. But she didn't stop. Blast after blast tore at the door itself until the flaming doorway fell from its hinges without the dwarven lock that held the door shut moving. Perhaps they should have gotten dwarven doors, Every said. A sudden blast of cold struck near them. The king's ruses had arrived. Nikali pulled Selby through the charred door and vanished down the revealed stairwell as Bry created a ward around them to protect the way into the doorway. Every, Fadis, Kirla, and Valrin descended first, and Bry held the ward in place. Go on. I will follow. Leaving Bry at the doorway, they ran down several stairwells that twisted into the inner bowels of the castle. It was dark and moist in the lower catacomb they found themselves in. Nikeli had set Selby in a corner of the passage the stairwell opened to. Stay here. You are too weak, my love. He kissed her on the forehead. Keep your sword. I took down the one for you. Let me take the rest. You have been through enough. She returned the smile. May Etha protect you. Every and Curla were already on the opposite side of the room. There was another doorway, but it was open. Come on, this way. Every and Curla led the way as the rest followed behind. They came to a large cavernous passage and could hear the sea. It was a hidden harbor with two ships beneath the castle. A cloaked man stood atop one of the smaller vessels. No further, he shouted. Every and Kirla sprinted forward, but the man summoned fire in his hands, throwing two fireballs. They dodged, but the blasts nearly struck Fadis and Valrin. The ship was nearly ready to sail. Get aboard, Every shouted. The king escapes. Every ran to get closer to the Rusis when a blast of ice threw him into the water. Kirla ran toward the edge of the ship as Fadis ran and slid nearly into the water, just grabbing onto a rock before he did. He grabbed Every's leg and pulled him ashore. Nikali had made it aboard and shifted along the deck, moving away from the Rusis and vanishing into the captain's quarters of the ship. Kirla hid behind a rock nearly at range for a throwing knife, but she only had one more. She had gotten rid of some of the others when she was changing for the king again, and now she didn't have what she wished she did. Fadis slapped Every, and he came to, sitting up just for another blast of ice to barely miss him. Kirla took that moment to close the distance with the Rusis, tossing her knife, but he deflected it, responding with a blast of electricity which missed. She jumped to the ship and drew her sword at the Rusis. Metal cannot stop magic. It does not matter. You have failed. Nikeli emerged from the captain's quarters. The ship is empty. No one is here. Just past the ship, the other ship was already moving away. Nikeli went to jump to shift into leaves toward the other vessel, but the Rusis sent a blast of fire directly at him, which just missed him, but was enough to knock him over the deck and into the water. Fadis made it on board, as did Every, with Valrin just behind him. Magic cannot be defeated with swords. Do you not know who I am? I am the greatest of the lost race of Rusis. I am... A sudden barrage of icy spikes struck him. He turned to see Bry and the entrance to the secret harbor. Kirla and Fadis lunged, both stabbing him in his upper chest. He stumbled back before cursing something. He ran to the edge of the ship and leaped, casting waves of ice down below him and running upon a hastily constructed yet slippery path of ice magic all the way to the escaping vessel. Bry made it to the ship and sent several blasts of fire, but the Rusis on board the king's vessel deflected it. Damn the king! Every shouted. This vessel! 
Is it seaworthy? It looks to be, Bry said. But before any other discussion could be had, the way the king escaped was suddenly blocked by a cascade of boulders, and in so, they could not pursue it. Let us get back to the castle and check on the others, Every said. Nikali spat and pointed at Valrin. Your ship! You can pursue him! Let's go! They hurried back the way they came, grabbing Nikali's wife and reaching the king's throne room to find several dead Rusis and no guards of the king remaining. Fadis looked up to see at least two dozen rangers. Fadis and Kirla the rogue, one of them said. Do we know you? Fadis asked. He is Ridua, a half-elf of the southern Taria rangers. A newer leader, but the head of them nonetheless, Kirla said. The man smiled smugly. True, but we have called all rangers to this place. We have sent out crows to all who had been in hiding. Had we known, more of us would have been ready. The king's guards who did not fall within the castle have fled with the many versions of the half-naked forms running away. Quite a hilarious sight, to be honest. We had thought these two caught up in the fighting to the south, Ridua said, motioning to Andok and Badur. Many rangers that way have went silent, but we were surprised when word came that someone was attacking the castle here. The king deserves only death, Curla said. He had many dressed up as himself as part of some game. I have never seen such a thing. One of the king's attendants stepped forward. The king is gone? The woman asked as she shook. You are going to kill us. No, Fadi said. Do you know where he is headed? The woman shook her head. No, he didn't tell us lower types. Good riddance. We can finally say it. You rangers are welcome here. My sons, both of them, were rangers in his cursed war. His army is far from here, so you must act while you can. We will help you secure the castle. He was afraid of this. He kept many versions of himself, but I swear it was some magic, not actual people. Perhaps it was, Curla said. There were only three or four of them who looked different in his bedchamber. The rest were like him. The Rusis, another man said. He has magic like this. He is a strange man. He and his type never seemed normal, and we had seen them vanish as if not there. Fadis looked at Bry. Do you know of Rusis magic like that? No, not magic to create phantoms. It must be something else then, Every said. My wife needs a healer's care, Nikeli said. I will stay with her, Bry said. You all go, pursue the ship. We will take care of her, Ridua said. Go now, kill the king and secure the mission of the rangers. You can trust them, Curla confirmed to Nikeli. They will not outrun the Ayla sunrise, Valrin said. Let's end this. Leaving Bry and Selby, the others hurried back to the kitchen and the pathway that led to the Ayla sunrise. They jumped aboard, and Valrin ran to the helm. He disengaged that which hid the ship, and the many crystals hummed to life, appearing from the wood of the deck. Dwemhar devices, Every said. Truly, it is a realm ship like the stories. You have no idea, my son. Every was smiling as the ship began away from the shore with haste. The waves were battering the shoreline now, but the rain had stopped. Fadis glanced up at the moon now visible and noticed it was blackened. The black moon, Every said. Our kin face evil times, Nikeli said. Kirla, Revlas, and Bevlas were eager and ready along the edges of the ship, though it was doubtful they'd actually catch the ship as simply as they all wished. We must kill this king and then get back to our people, Every said. Fadis remained quiet. His target was the king. He should have never left to fight in his war. He should have never left his wife and son for some duty as a ranger. He could not do as Nikali had done and save the woman he loved once, but he could assure the king of Taria never hurt another. That was his mission now. He would complete it. Part seven, holding. Not one warrior was still. The lines were fully engaged. Evern and Avium had returned to the same gritty battle with no sign of either side backing down. The front four ranks of Varmark elves had put away their bows, 
and now a shield wall of moon-shaped shields interlocked with spears thrust and poked at the continuous waves of demon men. Half the grand stairs were lost. Archons cast spell after spell into the air, just above the ranks of their fellow kin. Immolation took many of the ranks of advancing forces as the barrage of arrows to both thin the attackers from the ground and prevent those who came from the sky depleted. Avium had repelled at least four waves of the flying creatures herself. Evorn had to carry her to the back of the lines to rest with Archons who had used all their strength already. Rangers had made several fires as some of the Archons worked to make more elixirs to restore the magical energies of the Archons. Lord Relia and Richt had moved to the far northern flank, working with the stags to keep the rampart running down to the lower gateway from falling, but the stags were beyond tired. The creatures stumbled, moving back behind the lines as the elves tried to hold. But the elven center waned. A blast of magic from below sent a freezing barrage blasting a hole through to the courtyard. Ruach was the first in the gap, charging to the front and decapitating three demon men before using his wand to blast back three in an arching flame. Two more beasts came upon the elf captain. He smashed the closest, shattering the orb at the tip of the wand, and drew a small axe, spinning his way down the great stairs and throwing back their enemy. The elven line behind him recovered, advancing in haste, clashing with shield and spear, and holding the middle ground on the stairwell. Evern advanced with several archons, using his staff to dispel random attacks coming from the lower levels. The hour grew late, and the moon sank away. Dawn would soon be upon them. But another icy wind blew fogs in a thicker form over the entire expanse. Shadowy figures appeared on the walls in greater numbers. The strange, tentacled creature that had taken the largest tower moved one of its many arms directly into the thralls of demon men. The creatures crawled upon the arms, moving up and over the elven battle line. Rangers in the courtyard ran to the stairwell. They threw spears and small knives, utilizing what they could to deter or maim the attackers. Lord Relia was back up, his arm bandaged. He gripped the horn around his neck and blew three times. Ruach looked back, but many of the demon men had dropped between his line and the courtyard. Ever noticed how many charred forms they fought upon, seeing the mere mass of organic material before them. His spells had not worked before, but perhaps now they would. He cast his earth magic, and vines exploded upward, knocking back many of the thralls moving along the shadow arms of the tentacled creature. He directed his vines to grip the arms, much to the protest of the creature on the tower. The vines pulled at shadow arms, constricting and changing their form from pure blackness to that of a gray color. A group of archons ran upon the arms, jabbing their staves in the strange substance and using life magic in an attempt to dispel the shadow. The entity ripped its arms out of the vines, recoiling them into itself and severing the root behind the elven battle line. Ruach fell back, taking position at the top of the great stairs, as he expected the attack to continue, but the demon men did not pursue. The shadowy figures took form directly in front of the demon men. Avium was back up, and with Lord Relia joined Richt and Ruach near the front. Several arrows flew in the direction of the vampire lords, but none landed. Defenders of the city of our guard, why do you defend such a place with no chance of escape? One of them asked. Ruach stepped forward. Perhaps a greeting would suit this discussion. I am Ruach, captain of Fickmark under the King of the Woods, Suvasel. You are Vampire Waste, but I am sure you have a name. The center figure, not the one who had spoken before, stepped forward. Evorn noticed that the sun was upon the horizon, and the skies had already shifted to red and orange. The great fog over the city had begun to recede, and though still plentiful behind the vampire lords, the demon men had begun to depart, or at least vanish into the city. The vampire lord before them knelt. Brave Ruach, I am of Clan Silverfang, third line of succession from the Queen Mothers. 
We have come to retake our position in the world. Our city returns to life. Our followers are plentiful and strong. What right do you have to deny us this? Are not the elves lovers of life? We simply wish to exist in this place with you. Exist? Ruach asked. And by exist, you wish to ignore the laws set down well before present times? You were banished away and given a place to exist. The living realm is not your home, nor will it be again. Ruach of Fikmark, you know you will die. Our strength grows. With the coming of dawn we rest, but our armies remain in the city and fields and woods of this region. You are trapped with nothing but death as your only path forward. I shall enjoy the taste of your blood, Ruach. I come for you next. Pray to whatever god you must, for I sense rain and dark clouds on the horizon this morning. Such dark cover will allow my minions adequate conditions to continue our attack. The Silver Fang clan vampire vanished, and with him, the other vampires. The courtyard was free of attackers. Finally, none of the hosts spoke. Some sheathed their weapons and collapsed to the ground, while others looked at their dead king around them. Ruach turned as he drew in deep breaths. Lord Relia embraced him. We held the line, Lord Relia said. Indeed, Ruach responded. Gather our dead. Do not leave them to be transformed into something of the enemy. Burn them. Over the next few hours, Evern and Avium worked to move bodies into a large pile. The stench of the burning dead was beyond horrid, and the psychological effect of such was perhaps even worse. The remaining host wished for the reinforcements that were hurrying their way, but even so, any rattle of a pebble or sudden screech from the city caused them to stir. Though potentially pointless and likely so, the rangers and elves worked to fortify their position using broken timbers to make rows of spikes on the lower level of the stairwell. Furthermore, Rick directed his purified ones into the city to see if any supplies could be found, and by chance, several potions of magic and life were acquired and deemed safe by the Archons. Though storm clouds were on the horizon, for now, the early morning winds brought a level of peace. Evurn, lying next to Evium in an attempt to get some rest, worried about what the night had brought for their friends, and at the same time, hoping that Suvasel would indeed arrive to reinforce them. The host, though quite proud before, had been beaten down. There were no smiles. Well, except the two rangers who had obviously had too much wine for their morning beverage. The fires of the city rose in a high plume, drifting over the city almost as the fogs had before. Evern stood smoking his pipe again. He puffed and chewed on the end, wondering of those around him. Ruach was over to his side, brushing his stag. He noticed Evorn staring at him. A good friend of mine, faithful beast, capable of more than we give them credit for, but truly a companion and not a servant or slave. If anything, I am its servant. The lords of the groves they were called when I was much younger. They have more of a reason to fight in this battle than even I do. It was the scourge of the demon men in the first war that took their sacred groves. I have heard the story of the vampire lords, but I still wonder why the elves of the West allowed a parley of any kind. Ruach finished brushing the stag. Go get water, my friend. Rest, for battle comes again soon. Ruach joined Evern with a pipe of his own. It seemed the captain had misplaced his tobacco. Evern offered some of his own supply, which Ruach took. Do not worry, elf. It is not poison. Ruach chuckled. I do not worry about that, Shadow Elf. If by poisoning is how I am meant to die, so be it. I'm going to smoke. A high elf who isn't a prick. A strange finding. As they both smoked watching the fire of the city grow larger, Ruach coughed and smacked his lips. To answer your question, it is because of our treatment of the orcs in the eyes of the other races that we parlayed with the vampires. We took a higher path, allowing them to live versus killing every one of the bloodsuckers in their own streets. We did it to the orcs, or so my people. This war, if we can prevent their rise, will go differently. My king does not parlay. 
That is why no dwarf still breathes in Harkinok. No doubt an unpopular way to deal with those who have come against you? Your king treats our adversary in a way that shadow elves would find ideal. King Suvasel spent time in the east. It is more of a reason for him not to trust your race, but some of the ideals have bloomed into his own leadership. I can tell you, I'd like no one else beside me than my king in a battle. I do hope he arrives soon. At this point, Ruach glanced around at the many tired, bruised, and bleeding warriors around them. The Archons distributed what arrows remained, the heads now glowing after the enchantments. Do not aim for a single target, the Archons specified. We have infused these with chain lightning. Aim for groups of targets, and once the arrow is near the grouping, the head will split, striking several targets at once. Avern looked up at the rising sun, but noticed that the sky was darker than normal, too. He saw that the black moon was still visible. Fogs met the deep smoke in the lower parts of the city, and some time passed before both Archons and Rangers returned. Ever noticed that Ruach seemed more uneasy than he had before. He offered him another bit of tobacco, which the elf took. We have arrows to last another wave. Then we shall rely on swords and magic alone. But even our supply of elixir runs low. The rangers report that they cannot escape the valley. They lost three of their own just riding across the open fields toward the road we took. Avium joined them. Do you feel rested? Evan asked. As much as I can in this place. My mind was bombarded with images. I could see the old god from the stories we were told before. I saw the sacrifices of many innocent in the name of the false god. The vampires are on the verge of our realm. The shadows we see, they are projections of that which comes. I hear the infantile screams of the flying creatures, born from the queens themselves. They speak to me with hisses in the recesses of my mind. I do not know what they say, but there are many servants to the vampires, though I cannot tell who leads, be it the queens or the vampire lords that near our realm. The queens, Ruach said. The vampire lords control the territory and outward reach of the clans. They command the armies, like a necromancer and its thralls of undead, but the vampires fall under the queens. The queens themselves are like spiders. They make nests in the dark recesses of places where shadows hide all. The younger queens typically starred as virgin humans and elves, killing all around them to make their own vampire lords. For this reason, new queens in the old world would face ridicule and fall under attack by other queens, one of the reasons we were able to break their lines before. In fighting was their weakness, and in that time, we had giant beasts from the deserts, scorpions that loved the taste of vampire blood. We sent hunter elves atop these beasts and crawled the mountains and caverns of the lands, seeking out these queens. But alas, the race of scorpions is lost. The vampires have learned, or at least for now, they work together, I'm sure. If this city is taken by them, we shall have a greater trouble upon us. I worry of more than just Sailmark. The smoldering city beneath them was shrouded in fog once again. It is time, Richt said. My purified ones have taken stones into the charred remains before us. They will turn demon men within the greater force, attacking from within. Long we have been discarded by elves and dwarves, but now we will do all we can in service. Lord Relia drew his blade. Richt! Once Dwemhar, now commander of the purified, you have the honor of the elves this day. Songs shall be written of those who were discarded, who fought for those who were wrong. Indeed, Richt said with a bow. Screeching tore across the city. The flying creatures had returned. Hold your arrows, Avium said. Ruach signaled the archers to not fire as Avium floated upward. Rocks, debris, charred wood, and all substances not secure rose with the enchantress. Her eyes burned with white fire, and as the creatures flew toward the defenders, Avium pushed her hands forward. The debris was like volleys of arrows, striking the creatures one after another. As many of the creatures fell to their deaths, 
they became as projectiles themselves, flying into the others around them. Avium focused her energies, sending more debris and more of the fallen into the flying creatures. Her body became as a great fire, and with a flash of light, the sky turned brighter than day, and in the rolling clouds going up and over the city, thousands of flying creatures fell to their deaths, raining down those hidden in the fogs like a barrage of stars falling from the heavens. A VM dropped to the ground and then fell backward. Avern dropped to catch her before her head struck the stone of the stairwell. It is done. I can do no more, but I sense the flying creatures have been all but defeated. Ruach drew his blade. We will take the rest, Avium. The rest were upon them. The lower level of the grand stairwell was cloaked in fog once again. Evern carried Evium like a child in the crook of his arms. She quivered, her eyes struggling to stay open. That was quite an attack, my child, Evern said. Sweat poured from her body, and behind him he heard the shriek of the demon men. He wished to take her to where the Archons were healing the others. There she'd be safe. But shadows fell over the courtyard. The great creature atop the towers above them seemed to grow larger in size. More tentacles of shadow dropped down in the courtyard, and now shadowy figures stood on the walls on the rear flank of the elves. Evern turned, looking back toward the elven line. The enchanted arrows flew toward their targets, propelled by the keen-eyed elves sending explosions of lightning into the sky. They were running out, though. Evern went to the cavern dug by the statues of the false god, carrying Aveum to the far end. The nodule of power, a large crystal, seemed to be glowing with a faint light. As he laid her next to the crystal, she looked up at him. Do not leave me. I am weak. I believe that soon. We'll have no choice but to fall back into this place. I must help the captain. The lines were overwhelmed. Ruach directed the last volley of arrows into the ramps on the northern side of their defense, and almost simultaneously, the stags that had so valiantly defended that side charged horn first into demon men. The elves on the northern side were overwhelmed. The shadow figures were now within the lines. Archons brought down pillars to block the pathways, but the enemy climbed and jumped from the now elevated position. Richt pulled many fallen Archons toward the chamber where the nodule was. Avorn stood atop the broken ground. He had few vials left that were of any use to him or anyone else, but he had ceased sending spells at distance and instead sent waves of fire at the demon men closing in around the courtyard. Ruach drew a second blade, this one much shorter than his first. Elves of Varmark, rangers of the Riverlands, rangers of Taria, fall back, fall back. But his commands were drowned by the sheer number of demon men on the upper level. He took his horn, blowing several times. Elves formed around him. Rangers did the same, though it was difficult for Evern to tell who had greater fear in their eyes. As the waves of demon men swarmed the opening, elven blades sang. Ruach took a bow from one of the defenders. They had no more arrows to speak of, but Ruach had a single arrow of white. He put the arrow to string and pulled it to cheek, aiming into the sky. As he released, it streaked with a loud screech, arching high above before exploding in a flash of white that expanded out in a great wave. Evern's fiery attack had sapped him now. He began smacking the pale faces as they drew closer and closer. He could see solitary forms, shadows of near substance, approaching from all sides, wading through the seas of demon men. Ruach's friend, the stag from before, charged upon the area where Ruach was. The beast was bleeding profusely. Its horns were broken. It looked toward them as if wondering why they had not fled, before the demon men tore it apart and devoured the creature. Ruach pushed his kin into the passage. Evern joined Ruach as the last two defenders. The demon men swarmed the opening, only just pushed back by the defenders within the passage. Hundreds of elves had fallen in the past few hours. Few remained to defend. With the last bit of magic he could muster, Evern smashed the side of the cave, bringing rocks down upon the entrance. He had blocked the way in, 
but the question was how long it would last. Part 8. Sunrise in Taria. The Ayla. Sunrise cut through the water with haste. Valrin was leaving the cove with the castle of the now-fleeing king and heading east. This took them deeper into what was known as the Wild Lands of Taria, a region to the far north of mountainous regions and very few settlements, at least as Fadis described it. Tarmina and Tarsol are two of the northernmost villages in this region, but it is a bit of a journey to get there from the coasts. So, Every growled, will he just hide in a cave somewhere? No, back then, there were fishers' camps back here, unless he plans to sail in the waters north of Taria or toward the islands further east. I do not believe he will flee for long, Valrin said. They looked up, seeing the ship they sought in their direct line of sight. Fadis drew back on his bow and sent an arrow across the water, but it fell well short. The winds are against you, Nekali said. Captain, can you move closer? Valrin held the wheel to the right, fighting the currents, pushing them out to sea and the crosswinds over the surface of the water. The vessel they were pursuing had stayed near the coastline early on and had caught a different current than they had. In the early morning hours, the tides were shifting. The king's vessel ran aground in the distance. Valrin wheeled as far right as he could, shifting across the surface of the water and escaping the current, now closing in on their quarry in the early light of a red sunrise. Nekali and Fadis drew back on their bows, keeping their sights ahead, watching for their targets. Bevlas and Revlas pulled arrows to cheek and watched the trees. Several blasts of fire came not from the ship, but from the forest itself. The spells flew into the side of the Aela sunrise. Rusis! Valrin shouted. Fadis and Nikeli released their arrows, but in the dark, they could not tell if they found their targets. There by the crooked tree, Revla said. The two brothers released simultaneously. Their arrows landed, and a figure fell. Another wave of fireballs, and this time, another volley came from another part of the woods. Valrin was nearly upon the other ship. He wheeled back left, bringing the side of the ship parallel with the woods. He reached below him and to his crystal switches to control the Dwemhar vessel. Another volley. Valrin engaged the ward, and the spells exploded on the outside border of the ship. He quickly disengaged the ward and switched to the crystal weapons, sending a blast of energy into the woods. For a moment, the attack stopped. He had nearly run aground. Go! Fada shouted. Every leaped from the deck ahead of the others, sprinting through knee-deep water and jumping upon the king's vessel. Nikeli followed with Kirla just behind. Bevlas and Revlas moved with their bows into the tree line. Fadis kept an eye to the woods, knowing already that their foe had escaped capture. He isn't here, Nikeli said. That fat, poor excuse for a man has evaded us. Fadis looked to the woods. He couldn't see any movement, but it didn't mean they were watching. He had only seen the one Rusus go with the king, but considering he had an awaiting ship, it did not surprise him if there were more preparations already in place. Valrin, stay with the vessel. Keep watch for other ships. I believe it is time for skills I haven't used in some time, and I must be swift. Valrin nodded. I'd prefer to watch your backs. We do not know what other plans the king has. If we do not return by the next morning, return to the others. I cannot leave you if something happens. And if we get caught... They'll kill us, and anyone helping us. I know you are captain of the vessel I have happily sailed upon until now. This is my territory. I will see you by next morning. Answering to that which is like a child in our eyes, Nikeli said. He is a child to me, but so is every. Age does not determine capability. There are elves over eight hundred years old who you consider young, and I doubt they are all of the same capacity. Your point is taken. Nikeli said. I know of no villages this way. Where does he run to? Kurla asked. His death, Every replied. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. Bry had tried to sleep some, seeing as the events last night and into the early morning had taken their toll on her and her powers. 
she still awoke in a half-waking state just after sunrise. The others? she asked of several castle attendants who came to her. You mean the injured elf Selby? the one asked. Yes, where is she? Under constant guard and watch, the woman said, pointing to a room across the throne room. Bry saw three rangers standing outside the door, and beyond them she saw a bed and Selby. You must try to get some sleep, dear, the woman before her said. My name is Edel, and this castle has been my home my entire life. You are a slave, Edel, the old woman smiled. Hardly, but there have been much better rulers in this hall before now. The king's father was a wise man and ruled with a gentle but fair hand. His son is rotten, and it feels good to say it in these halls. The castle is afraid, but the rangers have told us we are safe. My friend Fadis was a ranger, and if you have a group of them watching the castle now, you're more than safe, I assure you. Very good, dear. I'll see about finding you some tea. It seems our cook was arrested, but I never liked that man to start with. The old woman chuckled as she went toward the kitchen. Rooses! A voice shouted behind Bry. She jumped, half thinking an enemy was upon her, but it was the ranger captain. He lifted his hands in surrender. I'll be careful not to spook you. He laughed. My apologies. I am still quite tired. He gripped her hands and knelt. I and my companions guard this castle, and the town is on our side. They were as ready to get rid of their old king as we were. Even the town guard has sworn fealty to the rangers. Go, rest, if you need it. I can't rest while so many of my friends face danger. I understand, Ridua said. What is your name? I do not believe I caught it last night. Bry. A beautiful name, like an elven princess walking in the mists of Narisand on an early morning. You're half-elf, as I understand it. The man didn't look elven at all. He even lacked the pointed ears and had the more rugged face of the race of men. My looks do not give that impression, but it comes out in my bulwark, not that rangers normally lack in that area to begin with. I love the elves we work with, and the beauty of the ancient cities encourages me daily to try to do all I can to defend all who live under the trees of Taria. This place is new to me. Bry said. They began to walk, pausing a moment to look at Selby, but then continuing. The elf has many injuries, but I feel her mind is the most damaged. She's afraid of almost every man who comes near her. I blame myself. You? Why? Selby was in the elven party we were supporting during a raid against the forces of Taria. It was when we first engaged the Rusis and were forced to fall back, we thought the elves had made it out, but horsemen hit their flank. She escaped, but then was captured, I guess. I blame myself, as I said. I should have never left her and the others. I make up for it now. We were watching the castle, as we always do. I received word that attackers had taken the walls of the keep, and that it was possibly the elves. I sent a message to the upper walls with an elvish greeting I knew from before. Thankfully, we were able to enter the lower area of the city and took down many random guards of the king under the watchful eye of the elves on the wall. Thus, we didn't catch elven arrows ourselves. They exited the keep and began across the still muddy ground of the inner wall, walking toward the gateway. Upon the walls, more rangers watched over them, and strangely under-equipped people in a ragtag group of men and women came to the gates. They knelt as Bry and Ridua approached. The new lord and lady? the man asked. Bry was shocked by the claim, and the man kneeling before them saw it, glancing over to Ridua. No, no, sir. I am the captain of the rangers alone. Did you gather those willing to fight? I did. We haven't had a militia in some time, but we are here. At least fifty more willing to fight plan to come at noon. Good. We need to ensure our defenses are strong and manned, and that if the armies of Taria return, we are ready. Where are they? The last we had heard, they were on the border of the Elven lands. Much has changed in the lands, 
and to be honest, I am not sure. A great host was rumored to have moved through the southern regions in the late evening. Many rangers reportedly went with them, but we did not have good communication with them before that. We will work on distributing weapons, the militia leader said. Good. Report back to myself when you are done, and we'll discuss supplies and plans in case of attack. The man nodded and departed with his group of warriors. You know of the host, Radua said as the other men left. Yes, they went to the shores of the greater Crescent Lake. Vampire lords threatened the lands. Their queens were already a problem. Speaking of, Andok and Badur, the two who came with you, have already gone out to summon all their companions, and even some dwarves to come back to the keep. It was those two who took down the first rising queen, but several more have since awakened. They have hidden away and built their strength. I do not tell the others, but I was aware of the black moon of last night. That, with the elven host, tells me what I need to know. Have you had any word from the elves or rangers who went that way? None. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. Fadis had stopped several times. The path they followed before was very evident before, but now there were burn marks at random through the woods and many more footprints in the dirt. Do you think they have gained more allies? More ruses? Kurla asked. I don't know. This strange magic that allows them to create copies of themselves or phantoms could be to blame, but I really do not know. Come on, let's keep moving south. It was nearing close to midday when they emerged from the woods to an open plain and a small lake. It was here they indeed found a village. It was very small, with no more than ten structures, and as they edged closer, following a washout that gave them some amount of cover, they didn't see any guards at all, no watchtowers, no patrols. The place was in Taria, but did not have any obvious allegiance to the king. We go as travelers. Use your cloaks, hide your weapons as best you can. They did so and arose from the washout and went to the main road. As they approached the village, they saw many men and women coming and going. There were many animal hides stretched out to dry, and it seemed the village was blanketed with some early snow sometime in the night. Entering the village, they walked past large torch basins where several men stood around, warming themselves. Elk are moving in the woods to the south. We should get a good few if we wait for them to move back across the river, and... The man stopped talking and stared at Fadis and the others. Strangers. More. I'm used to the hunter types, but you don't look like you're hunting anything. Those are elven cloaks. Every and the others shuffled their stances. Fadis knew they were going for their weapons, and the last thing anyone present needed was to start a scuffle in the streets. We are pursuing two figures. We do not want trouble with your village. The man scratched at his beard. No travelers like you say. Several strangers like yourself came in and went to the inn. It's no worry about myself. We don't worry of much here, a voice said from behind the man they had been talking to. It was a dwarf with blonde hair. The king bought these lands and set up this village for us hunters to have shelter in the deep winter. Most of us stay here throughout the good hunting seasons, and some of us live here. No enemies here amongst friends. We hope you do not bring trouble. Fadis bowed. We do our best not to. We shall head to the inn. Just keep following the road, the hunter said. You can't miss it. As they left the hunters, Fadis noticed Every and the elves were walking a bit further behind them than before. When we get to this inn, Fadis heard every whisper. Watch the rear doors and the windows. If we can corner him, that is all we need. Fadis noticed that some of the passers-by were staring back at them as they quickly moved off the street. Every moved back closer to Fadis. Son, perhaps a bit less determination in your walk. Blending in is a useful skill. Elves hide when we wish. We could take every one of those hunters, father. They are no enemy of yours or mine. Let's keep this as clean as possible. The inn was a two-story building, not too much unlike other inns across the lands, 
but instead of a rectangular design, it had a circular stone base. Windows lined both the upper and lower levels, and a large black wooden door seemed to be the only way in. The brother elves kept walking, intending to circle around to gain better vantage points to watch for those who might escape. Curla, Evry, and Fadis walked into the inn. This place is dwarven, Curla said under her breath. She was right. Fadis noticed that the bottom floor of the inn had many large pillars and dwarven runes decorating the walls. There were several open tables and a roaring furnace in the center of the inn itself. While it wasn't necessarily cold to Fadis outside, especially when compared to the glacial seas, the inside of this place was quite warm. A woman approached them. Welcome to the homeliest inn of the north. Seems I've been getting a bit more attention this morning than I'm used to. Are you going to threaten me as well? No, Fadis said. Should we be warned of those making threats? I don't normally talk about my guests' business, but rudeness is something we do not like in our happy village. The hunters can get a bit touchy when they drink too much, but enough people stick up for me, and even if they didn't, she said, unhooking a small axe from behind her back, I can deal with it. Who has threatened you? Curla asked. A fat man and several individuals with hoods. I could not see their eyes. I was told to lock the door under the king's command. I saw no king, and when they saw you coming up the road, they fled upstairs. Every brandished his elven sword as Curla drew her own weapons. Fadis pointed. Hide behind the bar. Do not come out no matter what you hear. The woman sighed. This happened once in Tarmina. Blood got everywhere. Try to make it clean and don't make me call the others. Fadis smirked at the woman's apparent lack of care at what was going on in her inn. She had more of an annoyance than a fear. They snaked up the stairwell. Fadis drew his longsword, watching their flank as Evry, Nikeli, and Kirla moved up to the upper level. There were several doorways. Evry motioned for them to be quiet, moving to the first door and signaling Nikeli to go to the next. Fadis and Kirla stood just beside another door. They each felt the doors and noticed that two were unlocked. Evry entered his, moving about with his sword at an angle near his head before re-emerging and shaking his head. Nikeli did the same and returned, finding the room empty. There were two additional doors. One was down the hall from them, while another was back the other way past the stairs. Evry and Nikeli went to the nearest door, finding it unlocked. Evry pushed the door open, and Fadi saw light coming from this room. He turned his stance, moving behind Evry as Kirla kept watch. As they pushed open the door, they saw a lone sleeping man, not the man they were seeking. They pulled the door closed and moved to the final door past the stairwell. This one was locked. Every levied a kick against it, sending the door shattering inward. Multiple figures in cloaks were on the other side. From behind them, the door from the room where the man had been sleeping opened with a slam. The man was standing now. He had his arms outstretched, and ice magic summoned around his palms. Rusus! Kirla shouted. The figures from the room before them did the same, their attacks almost in sync. Every and Nikili turned as leaves, moving toward the man they were in the most direct line of fire, slashing their blades across his neck and chest, dropping the form to the floor. There was no blood. Several spells flew toward them from the room, and one struck every center chest. It knocked him back, but he quickly stood back up, moving against the wall. The spell was not real. I am fine. Fadis and Kirla moved into the room where the men in cloaks were. Several spells flew toward them, and Fadis took a blast to his arm that sent a seething cold pain to his shoulder. Another blast hit him, but it was a fake. Curla struck multiple figures with her sword and dagger, taking down three of them in quick motion, leaving a final two. Which one? They both said at the same time. Leaves flew into the room, and Evry and Neckley materialized, driving their blades into both figures. 
One slumped down and vanished while the other poured blood from his chest. He looked up to the wielder of the blade that had struck him. Every drove the blade further up into his chest cavity. Foolish man, you come against Taria, you will... Fadis thrust his blade into the man's forehead. To their right, hiding in a dark recess of the room, was a quivering man. Curla lunged for him, pulling the man up. This is not the king, she said. Another decoy to throw us off. Please don't, please don't. We did not all have a choice. I wanted to take part in the king's party, but he transformed me to look like him. Please don't kill me. The others, they run to the woods. Go get them. Leave poor old me here. I only wanted to have some fun at the king's party. The king's party? The rape of his captured females? The man stared at Curla. You! You killed my good friend! You should be dead! He was my friend since we both started riding ponies at a young age. Why would you hurt such a gentle man? Curla gripped the man by his hair. What are you going to do? The man asked, quivering. She slashed his throat with one of her knives, pushing him back to quiver and shake, and he coughed on his own blood. The woods! We must hurry! Fadis said nothing to Curla, for there was nothing to say. He had not been in her position or a position even like hers. He had no right to judge her for killing that man or any others she came across. The king of Taria was indeed vile, but there were many associates of his who were just as bad, if not worse. They hurried down the stairs and found the woman who ran the inn between them and the door. She had her axe in hand. They have my daughter. They took her. You must stop. You must not follow them. The woman was shaking. Curla went to advance forward, but Fadis grabbed her arm. Where did they go? Fadis asked her. I don't know, she said, crying. The door of the inn opened and Bevlas and Revlas immediately drew their bows aimed at the woman. She looked behind her. You're going to kill me now? She'll be killed too. I can't protect her. What is this, Evry? Bevlas asked. Evry looked to Fadis. Put your weapons down, Fadis said. The woman fell to her knees, dropping her axe. She began to cry, and Fadis knelt with her. I will not let them harm your daughter if I can prevent it. I didn't want to hide her here. I saw them coming. I knew they'd hide here, but he knew where my home was. The king? Fadis asked. No, the cloaked Rusus. He is the king's main hand. He went upstairs, and then I saw him with her at the door to the inn once you went up. I thought she was safe. I thought you'd kill him. You are elves and assassins. The hunters heard word of an attack on the king's castle from rangers going that way. I knew his plan was in action. He built this place to hide. That's what they always said. They said this was a dwarven hideout before, and it was the king's now. The woman was beginning to ramble. Where did they go? One of the men upstairs said the woods to the west. Yes, there are caves there, but they took a quicker path than going back outside. Come, I will show you. She led them to the far side of the inn, and to a stone wall and stairwell that led downward. This connects to a dwarven room of some kind. There are crystals and a way for them to move great distances at once. That sounds Dwemhar, not dwarven, Fadis said. This is where he went? Curla asked. Yes, he had another with him, but the person was cloaked and stayed far from me. It was a large man like the one who went upstairs. Fadis grasped the woman's hands. We will retrieve your daughter if we can, I promise. Thank you for helping us. She became tearful again. Fadis and the others went down the stairwell. There was a lone crystal on the floor and a switch on the wall with dwarven ruins on it. Who knows dwarvish? Fadis asked. Every went to it. This doorway is similar to a Dwemhar construct I've seen in Sailmark, but it is indeed dwarven. He moved his hand along the wall, and then, using two hands, he felt his way down the sheer rock. I studied Dwarvish under King Tursua. He said it would help me further unite men, elves, and dwarves, something he saw as a key to coming darkness. 
The favored pupil, Revlas said. You're just jealous you could never reach my level of archery, Bevlis teased. Can you open it? Nikaeli growled. I get tired of chasing phantoms. My blade thirsts for our prize. Every stopped moving his hands and looked at them. Just had to find the right rune. He pushed into the rock as he pulled the switch on the wall, and the door opened to a hallway lit with glowing stones. Our passage is open. They proceeded forward, following the passage as it dipped down deep into the earth and soon opened to a grand room with high ceilings. Dwarven halls in Taria, Curla said. There are many dwarven places in the deep part of the earth at random places that one could only imagine, Nikeli said, though this was built when the dwarves were much more expansive and were not so smart as to stay in one place for many years, such as at Mikranok or Harodar. This is no doubt a smaller place, and will have many ways that our enemy could hide or escape. Fadis looked around. There was significant wreckage around them. Whatever path they took, he doubted it was one that took them over the mountainous amount of destruction. The path ahead was clear, with a large circular area with a statue in its center that rose high above them. Throka, Lord of Mountains, the patron god of the dwarves, Every said. You know a bit, Fadis said. Every winked. Yes, I've done my best to learn as much of the old and new world as I could. They could see a clear pathway beyond the statue and what seemed to be another passage. The pale light above them shining from large hanging lamps of arcane origin did not give them much more sight beyond that of their current path, but it was from their feet they caught sense of something else. The smells of this place are horrid suddenly. Or is that just me? Bevlis asked. Fadis could hear breathing, slow breathing. Rocks fell not too far from them, and both brothers put arrows to string. This place is old. These lamps, Fadis said. How do they work? Do they remain lit? No, Every said. They likely came to life when those we pursue came through here, or were lit by the Rusis who came through. What destroyed this place may still be here, and these lamps have done nothing to veil our presence, Fadi said. Quick, let us leave these dwarven halls. The group ran for the passageway, leaving the statue of Throka behind them. Fadis held up his sword, expecting someone or something ahead of them. Kirla did the same. They were nearly there. Fadis could smell the change in the air as he saw the path led upward. They'd ascend out and keep chasing their prey. They were close, and the fat king could not keep running. A shrill scream shook the entire company. Fadis turned back. Bevlas had vanished. Brother! Revlas shouted. They heard growls from the darkness beneath the pathway. Revlas ran to the edge and drew back his bow. Bevlas! Where are you? Bevlas! Fadis looked over the edge, and both he and Every noticed the creature at the same time. It moves to the center area, near the statue. It has him. I see him, Every shouted. Nikeli and Every ran for the statue as Revla stood on the edge of the pathway. Fadis and Kirla kept a watch on their flanks, spreading out in case the creature suddenly changed position again. Fadis looked back to Revlas as the elf jumped off the edge, releasing arrow after arrow. The creature wailed and slapped beneath the statue, causing large cracks to split the platform. A moment later, Revlas appeared in a wisp of leaves on the pathway. I landed several arrows in the beast. I could not see what it is. The statue of Throka fell away as the gray and brown form pushed itself through the shattered stone, holding the flaccid form of the elf brother. Cave troll! Nikeli said. He and Every were the closest to the beast. Bevlas reached out with a bloodied hand. The two elves and Every became as leaves, swarming the creature and materializing upon its form. The troll roared, swinging its massive arms and kicking at Kirla and Fadis as they tried to approach. It spun, nearly stumbling into the hole it had ascended from. Every and Nikeli were knocked off. Revlas was still upon the troll. He jumped to the troll's arm and slashed at its hand, severing many vessels and tendons. 
The troll released his brother, stumbling back and crying out. Revlas grabbed his brother, pulling him down the pathway. Fadis sheathed his sword, drawing back an arrow just as the troll went to sit back up. His arrow flew true, striking the creature in the chest. It roared again. Nakeli and Evry ran to catch up with the others. Kurla led the way, once again fleeing toward the passage out of the dwarven ruins. Fadis turned to see Kurla struck from the side, a long gray arm reaching over the edge of the passage. Another troll climbed upward. The rogue rolled against the side of the pathway, only stopping because of the raised ledge. Every sprinted, running along the opposite raised surface, leaping over Fadis and driving his blade down into the outstretched arm. This second troll roared and smashed the side of the pathway, fracturing it. Every's footing vanished beneath him, but Fadis gripped his son by his arm at just the last second, pulling him up and pushing him to move along what pathway remained. Fadis reached down, grabbing Kurla, who was conscious but shaken. Go into the passageway! Fadis turned to spot Bevlas and Revlas. Another troll had appeared between where the dying troll was and the broken pathway and the passage out. Nekali struck the troll nearest the pathway, just as it went to reach across, blocking the elf's path. It roared and fell off the causeway and struck far beneath them. Nikali turned to Revlas. Hurry, the creature gains on you. But Revlas had collapsed under the weight of his brother, who was no longer conscious. The elf stood over his brother, drawing back his bow. His arrow burst into flames, and he released the shot, striking the troll in the face. An explosion of fire engulfed the creature. He picked up his brother and turned to run, but could not. He dropped his brother and began to drag him by his arm, but then the collapsing troll fell upon the pathway on the opposite edge. The pathway crumbled and gave way. The elven brothers fell into the darkness. Every ran, moving to leap for them, but Nikali grabbed him, throwing him back. You cannot grab them and return. Not even with these suits is the power strong enough to grasp another. You'd only slow their fall. There was a thunderous shaking to the cavern, and roars filled the air. The passageway they stood in began to crumble, and Nikali pushed every up as Fadis turned with Kirla to run. They saw light ahead of them. Hurry! Fadis shouted. They emerged from the caves as the passage collapsed. They were in the middle of the woods beside two broken statues, overgrown with leaves. Every punched Nekali over and over. The elf held him, not releasing his grip. Are you done, boy? You can't bring them back. You could not save them. They died with honor, with love for one another. Do not dishonor them by acting a fool. We are leaves of Sailmark. We do not stop. We do not fail. Every sniffled and sheathed his sword as Nikali embraced him. Fadis sighed and Kirla embraced him. Go to him, she whispered. You don't have to stand away from him. Fadis swallowed his spit and slowly placed a hand on every shoulder. Nikali looked up at him and nodded, pushing himself from Every's grasp. Every turned to Fadis. They were like my brothers. We started as leaves at the same time. I know loss. I have lost many in my task as a leaf. But they were here because of me. Fadis embraced Every. They were here to kill a king, a king behind the blades that killed King Tursua of Sailmark. Let's finish what we all began together. Every smiled. Okay, father. He looked to Nikeli and Kirla and nodded. Fadis noticed a nearly hidden pathway leading up the hill with recently broken branches. They get sloppy as they tire. Or it's a trap, Kurla pointed out. There is only one way we'll know. They hurried up the pathway up the hill. There were ruins near the peak. If they were indeed this way, there was nowhere for them to run. Part 9. The Dwemhar Answer The rocks Evern had brought down to block the path were getting pulled out. Ruach exhaled loudly. Other elves near him formed a line. Rangers joined them. Avern had been sitting with Avium, but he knew she was unable to fight anymore. Rossi, his serpent, slithered up to his shoulder. My friend, 
I believe this fight shall be one truly of Shadow Elf Reckoning. Evern still held his staff, but his magic was beyond weak. He needed more elixirs, more vials of restoration to soothe his broken form, but there were no ingredients in this place. Fogs began to seep into the passage, and the rocks continued to tremble, pebbles rolling off the top of the larger pieces as clawed hands pulled at the stones. Ruach lunged forward, severing one of the hands. The other elves did the same. Lord Relia thrust his blade in one of the larger openings, and something on the other side ripped the blade away from him. Ruach let out a laugh. That is most unfortunate. He tossed him a blade. When we survive this, remind me to give you some lessons in sword work. Ruach's humor was not in bad taste. Ever knew Lord Relia was much older than Ruach, and while laughing in the face of what was before them was indeed strange, the other elves laughed at it. There was little hope beyond the shared laughs. The rocks were sucked away in a blast of fire. Demon men swarmed, crawling the cavern above and to their sides. The defenders slashed and stabbed, throwing back their foes in a final stand. But then the demon men sank away. The host of shadows swarmed the room, and many defenders fell to blades of blackness piercing through the rolling fogs. The shadows took form. The blanched faces of several vampire lords stared them down. Ruach angled his blade as he crouched down. Lord Relia held up his own blade. Evorn stood just to the side of Ruach. The elves cursed us before, one of the vampire lords said. We were forced from life, our kin sealed away. We make a path for all to return. In the glory of our queens, by the grace of our god, we return to the lands to that which will be a thriving place for our kind. The elves of the west have failed. I still hold my blade, filth of the banished, Ruach shouted. Take my blade and drive it into my heart, and you may make such claims, but as long as I breathe, you will have no claim to these lands. Sitra, the owl of Ruach, flew into the passage behind them. With a loud caw, Ruach then heard the thunderous approach of their kin. The vampire lords lunged toward the defenders. Evern blocked one of their bites with his staff, punching the skull of the lord as Ruach parried and slashed, turning one of the forms to shadow. The demon men near the rear of the passage were falling back. Great flashes of light lit the outside, and elven horn calls filled the air. As Sitra flew near Ruach, gouging the eyes of a nearby vampire, several more ran past the defenders, heading for the nodule. Evern threw his staff like a spear. The narrow end pierced the back of the skull of one of the vampires. Lord Relia ran past Evern, jumping with his blade well in front of him, and stabbed another vampire. There was one vampire nearly at the nodule, Relia spun, sending his blade twirling toward the vampire. It struck him in the chest, and he stumbled back. Relia drew a dagger, turning as leaves and moving at once into the fray, reclaiming his sword just as Avium pulled herself up. She sent a blast of energy outward, throwing back several vampires, but then falling herself. Evern fought hand to hand, punching and grappling with his foes. He held a vampire to the ground, punching its snarling face over and over, dark blood running down on the rocks. Relia screamed. A vampire had bit into his neck, and though the elf thrust his blade at another attacker, he dropped his weapons, pulling at the one that was gnawing on his neck. Evorn pointed, and Rossi slithered up, biting the vampire. It released its grip, and Ruach jumped over Evorn's head. Two rangers ran to aid Avium as another shadowy form appeared. Ruach pulled Lord Relia against a wall. The two rangers were both suddenly pulled into the newest vampire's grasp. It squeezed their throats and their forms collapsed. Evorn and Ruach jumped between the vampire and the nodule. Back! Form of shadow! Ruach shouted. There is only one true shadow. That is our god. In his name, I bring about the cataclysm of your time. There were flashes of magic at the front of the cave. Leaves flowed inward. A moment later, 
Suvacel, with his high helm of gold and blade held aloft, charged into the cave. The leaves of Selmark took form just in front of him. The final vampire lord lurched forward. Ruach took the brunt of the hit, driving his blade into the upper chest of the vampire. Evorn smacked the back of the vampire as Rossi and Citra attacked his head. The pale, clawed hand of the vampire touched the nodule of power as the blades of Suvacel and each of the leaves of Sailmark struck. The nodule flashed to life. I have honored my god, the vampire shouted as blood ran from his mouth. King Suvacel slammed his fist into the vampire's head, shattering his skull. The vampire was defeated. Suvacel pulled the form off Ruach, who kicked the corpse before him. Cursed beasts! Ruach turned to the crystal. Energy surged around it. He pulled his king's sword to his neck. I have dishonored you, my king. End me. I deserve nothing but death. We defended, but I have failed you and our kind a moment before salvation. Suvacel pulled his sword from Ruach's neck. Captain, you defended valiantly. I cannot ask for anything but for you to rest. I have brought the forces of Fickmark and Sailmark at capacity. Even now the Archons work to throw down the stones of this place. If they seek to come from their realm, they will meet Elven Steel. We will do what should have been done the first time. I will see to the destruction of all who is here. Suvacel's Archons came into the cave with fresh elixirs. Evorn chugged the brew. It was missing something. Not that it wouldn't work, but he knew he could make better. Aveam was much better than she was, but felt the same failure Evern felt. The nodule was well alive, and even as they sat in its presence. The energy seemed to flow into the structure around them. What will it do? Aveam asked Ruach. My king moves into the tower beneath the shadow monster. He will tell us soon. We know it opens a portal, but where or when or what can be done, we do not know. Avern stared at the undulating energies from the crystal. It reminded him of the Ayla sunrise. He wondered how Valrin and the others were doing, as he knew that they were likely wondering how they were. He did not know their path from here, but as Rossi coiled back up his staff, he walked with Evium and Ruach back outside. The city was much more alight in green fire than it was before. The Archons were dismantling the city, but from the lake, the fogs of before had grown into a great column. For now, the darkness present before had lifted. They had a reprieve, or so it seemed. The shadow creature atop the tower was growing larger. The many dead were laid aside one another, and when most of the courtyard had been covered, more were layered atop them. Ruach was red in the face, and tears ran down his face, but he did not speak. The Archons spoke in their elvish tongue, sending waves of blue magic over the many dead, turning them to that of flowers and grass, a stark contrast to the city they were within. Evern looked out to the fields and saw the great host Suvasal had brought. The golden and silver lines of armored elves had not made camp or even fallen out of line. Like pristine statues, the host was assembled. From the southern side of the lake, another host came. This one had banners Evern had not seen. Several horses were headed for the city. Elven horns sounded. Houses of Firda, Rivda, the men of the High Horns, the men of Seviar, and the dwarves of Mikranok. Ruach jerked toward the announcer. Mikranok, dwarves... Suvacel and several Archons emerged from the tower. I hear the proclamations. Alas, our allies have received our messages. A dwarven force approaches with them, Ruach said. Your king is aware. Micronach contacted us. It seems that while Harkonach acted with Taria, it was not with the approval of the dwarf king. King of Jagged Peaks, King Vordar, has pledged to defend the outer wall of mountains. We will contain this evil. The houses of men come to assist. It seems that Taria is truly alone. When we have succeeded here, we will assure Taria is pacified. I have sent word to Narasond in the east and to the kingdoms of men in those regions. 
Our plight is heard, and many stand with us. The elves of the West will not stand alone. And what of the city? Of the portal? Evan asked. Shadow Elf, you and your friend, I need you to come with me. Ruach, greet the leaders who come. Have them stand their armies ready. We must be prepared. I take these two with me. Perhaps they can figure out that which our Archons do not understand. Aviam and Ruach followed Suvasel toward the large tower at the back of the courtyard. The entity atop the tower was beginning to turn white now, but it was not dying. It was transforming, becoming something else entirely. This form is not malicious to us, Aviam said. It is something else. That we did figure out, Suvasel said. That is the form of the creature that will curse these lands. It is of the Shadow Realms. It comes from the realm that has been cursed by the vampires. Also, the fogs over the lake hide but one portal. The vampire lords were only partially killed. Their physical bodies fall away, only to be restored, for they cannot die unless their skull is crushed. They prepare. The queens emerge with nightfall, but the portal to the realm they have been sealed is but one of our issues. As they entered the tower, the walls around them were bathed in the green torch fire present outside. It seemed as if they had entered a massive library. The number of books, the sheer number of them is amazing, Aviam said. Where are they from? Tomes of ancient knowledge, witchcraft, that which was written by the false god. We tried to burn them already, but fire does not touch them. Suvasel said. If I can give credit to the bloodsuckers, it is that they have a wisdom beyond most races in their utter desire for knowledge. It is what has made them such an adversary, and is another reason my kind did not destroy them as we should have. But they are not a creation of the great poet. Thus, they shall be destroyed. This time. Suvasel led them down a central corridor. While Aveam seemed utterly entranced by the place, she looked at Ivorn at the same moment he felt a great coldness come over him. We are not alone here, she said. No, Suvasel replied, which is why we must not delay. Following the corridor, they came to another room with a ceiling that they could not see the end of. Before them was a massive glowing wall. Runes of a strange design ran up and down the walls, Aviam stared upward. These writings, they are something older than I know, but I understand them. The Archons feel a growing power here, like a portal, perhaps, but they feel it could be reduced or slowed. Aveum did not respond. She was deep in thought, staring with intent. This tells of the Dwemhar who were here before. This was a city once attacked by the Rusis, they had lost the perimeter and sought a way, a way to death. The Dwemhar who wrote this had given up. She paused. How do we keep the portal closed, Aviam? Does it say how to close this off? Evern asked. This is not a portal, Aviam said. She looked at Evern and Suvasel with widening eyes. We must run now. She did not wait for them. Avern and Suvasel ran to keep up with her. They destroy the city, she shouted. It was a Dwemar construct, but this was meant to decimate the city and all around it. The portal is something we cannot stop. It was activated and in turn, the city was brought to our land. The creature above, it is what shall spread the blight you feared, Suvasel. The vampire lords have brought the city from their lands. The portal to bring the city is open. They shall bring back whatever it was they were sent away with, and that we cannot stop, but they have brought a gift to those who sealed them away. The wall had newer inscriptions. A message was written after what was to be a Dwemhar-designed trap for their Rusi's attackers, and it is the perfect summary. Elves of the West shall suffer, stricken away as we were forced away. May the ancient powers of the West bring about the fall of the immortals of the woods. As they reached the outside, Suvasel grabbed Eveam's arm. What is it? A curse? A device meant to kill all within and around the city, like dwarven dust, 
but an explosion of energy more powerful. Get the armies away, now! Suvasel ran toward Ruach. Sound retreat! Pull our forces away from the Crescent! The many houses of men looked at one another, confused. The elven captains present were shocked at Suvasel's order. Horns blared. Suvasel, Ruach, Ivern, and Aevium took to stags and mounted. Evium closed her eyes as fogs rolled around them. Night was falling. The black moon seemed to gain a ring of fire around its form. The green flames of the city went out. As they began to ride out of the courtyard, Avorn tapped Evium with his staff. What is it? What do you feel? We have no time. Ride. Now. Their haste quickened. The winds flowed over them, and the fogs billowed in a great column. Elven horns continued to sound. They rode through the city. Reaching the gates seemed to be taking longer than it should, but they passed the gateway, and it seemed the fogs over the lake rose high above the sky. Bolts of blue lightning shot at random from the city to the lake and back. The mountaintops around them were alight in white fire. What is happening? Ruach shouted. The ground quaked. A glowing form appeared before them. Their stags stopped. They were some distance from the city, but still not far enough, and the city itself now glowed as a great white light. The form before them reached out. The body was feminine and appeared as if made of thousands of stars. I, Etha, goddess of the elves, command you to halt. You cannot escape. But the folly of the false god's creation shall not be your undoing this day. Avium, use not the power of the Rusis, but of the Dwemhar. You cannot run from this. The elves did well in not destroying that which they feared, but such malice created by the false god of the vampire's axe without the blessing of the gods of the north or the great poet. So our blessings are upon you. Shield yourselves. Aether! Suvasel shouted. The goddess herself! Avium had already dismounted. She closed her eyes, crafting a ward that grew many times over them, shielding the host. Evern stared, seeing the image of Aether behind Avium. He did not care for the gods, but he had no issue with this one at the time. It seemed that the creations of the false god coming against those of the living realm were enough this day for the gods to act at least in a small form, a drop in the pool of an ever-darkening path towards darkness to come across the lands. The ward around them blocked out all except a blue glow. The wall Avium created was massive, something larger and only possible because of the divine intervention. Praise be to Etha, Ruach said, mother of elves, protector of the sacred. The ground shifted under their feet. They were suspended. Avern floated up into the air, as did everyone else, and he felt himself floating at a rapid pace. For a moment, his eyes went black, and then all he could hear was the sound of rushing winds. Look! Ruach shouted. It had been only a few moments, but Evorn could see now. The clouds above them had curved around the valley, but the valley itself was a smoldering ruin of broken stone and fire. Where the city was now was only a swirling mass of white fire, and fogs descended back down into the valley. They were atop the mountains. Suvasel was on his knees, looking now behind him. By the grace of the goddess, the elves had been spared. The many fleeing were protected but disorganized. He did not know of their allies to the south. The goddess appeared again. My intervention is beyond what some would allow, but Kel is prepared for your offerings and prayers. War will engulf the lands. I have but delayed a greater travesty. The demon men, the many servants of the false god, and all that comes is darkness. Elves. Workings are upon the lands for greater deeds than you all know. I am with you as I am in all times. My starlight shall be upon you now. Face the darkness. Do not despair. Suvasel stood as Etha's form vanished. Now is the time, he said to the others. The time for swords to be high and for us to throw down what was before allowed to live.
Evern looked down to the grasses atop the cliffs, seeing them wither and die. The blight has begun, Ruach said. Fog settled into the valley, and shadows appeared out of the white, fiery portal. Streaks of silver spread out along the valley like a large web. This valley is lost, Suvasel said. Let us rally our armies. A great war has begun. Part 10. The Coward. The ruins they ascended were long lost to the hills themselves. This dwarven tower, once a peak in the old world, was nothing but an overgrown and lost skeleton of what once was. The pinnacle of the hill, seen from behind the bent wood of Fadis's bow, had several columns and large fallen rocks surrounded by trees and no way of escape. He wondered if in cornering their fleeing enemy they had just played into the jaws of his trap. Every moved with Kirla to the right along the outer ring, as Fadis and Nekeli moved to the left. There was no movement or sign of where they could have gone, but their enemy was not hiding. Fadis noticed a figure standing with a fat man just next to him. The figure floated just above the ground and seemed to be holding one hand on the figure next to him. Evry and Kurla had stopped and knelt in the bushes on the far edge of the peak, still within sight of Fadis. Fadis signaled for them to wait, making a signal that he'd release his arrow first. He was the only one remaining with a true ranged weapon, and the warrior before them was no doubt the ruses from before, even with his hood down veiling his face as it was. He pulled the string back further, centering his shot. He released. The arrow flew perfectly, splitting through a few leaves and striking the fat man. Not his target, not the Ruses he knew he had to surprise. The Ruses had moved the man in front of the arrow's path. As he dropped the man next to him, he pointed his fingers at him, and a bolt of electricity struck the fat man, leaving him a quivering mass before the Ruses engulfed the man in flames. He has killed the king, Nikali said. No, Fadis said. There is no king here. We've been following something meant to lead us away. This was another decoy. Every had his sword behind him. He signaled for him and Nikali to move forward. That man will kill you two if you attack. He stands in the open waiting for you, Fadis said. Agreed, Nikali said. Fadis threw down his bow. What are you doing? Nikali asked. Be ready, he said. Fadis stepped out into the opening, raising his hands. Rusis of Taria, I wish to speak to you. The Rusis moved his hand outward, summoning spells of fire. You give up? It isn't that, but I know you've been leading us away. Decoys, magic to hide your different kings, as it were. Now you've taken a little girl. I had a Rusis threaten me like that before. I'd really like to not repeat such actions. It didn't fare well for the last Rusis. I'm not like other Rusis. Oh, so you're special. Fuck that. You're just like the rest of the Rusis. A scattered, leaderless, broken people. What would you know, Ranger? You are a wanderer of the wild. A broken man lost to life. I wander upon the seas, actually. Valrin, captain of the Aela Sunrise. You likely haven't heard of him, but that's fine. We tend to do things beyond the sight of any king of Taria. I've been broken, but I'd say I'm on top of life now, not so much lost to it. I was lost to it under your king, which makes me wonder, why would Arusis serve the king? Especially someone of your power? What does the king do for you? Why would you, Arusis of considerable power, not trying to draw me out, as was the purpose when my son was taken and my wife murdered, take a child? It just doesn't make sense. Everything up until this point has been reactive, random, as if not even you have power over yourself and your decisions. Why would you take a child? Fadis, you were weak then. You are weak now. I was your king then. I am your king now. There are many objects of power in this world, and I have brought you to your place of death. Your friends in Taria will relinquish control of my castle, and when my armies return, they will kill all within that place. The rangers of the north will at last be defeated, just when they thought they had won. 
Now, kill this Rusis, if you can. The Rusis flipped back his hood, his eyes flashed white, and in a blast of fire, Fadis was thrown back. Several bolts of nearly uncontrollable flashes of lightning struck just near him. Kirla, Evry, and Nikili rushed forward, each dodging as the Rusi spun in place, sending spells of ice, fire, and lightning at random. Fadis pushed himself up, unscathed but angry. He drew his sword, charging the flank of the Rusis, just for the man to grab hold of his blade and send currents of lightning into the hilt. He dropped the sword, but just as he did, Nikeli and Evry ran upon him, their swords nearly cutting through his back, but in a blast of ice, he blocked their sword points, jumping into the air and turning the ruins of the dwarven structure molten with streams of arcane fire beyond anything they'd seen Bry do. The Rusas landed on the edge of the molten pool, pulling out a container of a strange sand. Fadis ran toward his bow as the Rusis attempted to send his powers into the container. This I do for the king. Dwarven dust! Every shouted out. Fadis drew back on his bow, sending an arrow at the jar of dust and knocking it from the Rusis. The contents poured out on the ground, and the Rusis summoned his powers around him. The fires from the previous spells reached the dwarven dust, and an explosion rocketed the Rusis down the side of the mountain. Fadis and the others were just out of range of the fire, and as the Rusis' previous spells dissipated, leaving barren rock atop the hill, they hurried to the edge of the ruins and the pathway that led back down. I do not get it, Every said. Even with dwarven dust, he would not have killed us all. That Rusis was trying to kill me, a vendetta of the king. I don't think that Rusis knew what he was doing. He was under control of our quarry. Come, Curla said. I see movement below. Our enemy yet lives. Fadis and the others made their way down the hill and found the Rusis with scorched robes and bloody cuts all over his face. His face was partially burned, and he looked at them with green eyes. Where am I? Who are you? he shouted. Every and Nikali had their blades at his neck before he could say anything else. Fadis knelt in front of him. Who are you? Then we'll discuss who we are. The Rusis blinked several times, staring at each of them as he did. Where am I? I don't know where I am. Do not play games! Every shouted. He went to punch the man when Fadis grabbed his arm. No, wait. The man was shaking. He looked about as if there were creatures he expected around him. What is this place? Is this near old Rena Grace? Rin what? Curla asked. At the mention of these words, Nikali knelt. Rusis, that place is beyond the Vinda Sea. No one has been there in elven reckoning since the flooding of the glacial seas. At least, that is as believed. Rena Grace has fallen then? What is Rinagrace? Fadis asked. A Rusus city, or it was a Rusus city, the capital of Rusus lands. We hail from Sailmark, Nikali said, on the eastern shores of the Vindus. To the south is Vuerik, the city of House Firda. I do not know these names, the Rusus said. My mind sleeps. I do not even know what happened to me. Dwarven dust, Fadis said. You were trying to kill us. We've been on your trail, or more so, that of the King of Taria. It seems there are many doppelgangers and magic of a strange kind. That is not strange. It is a common skill with my people. I had thought Rusus were just elementalist casters, Kirla said. What? You do not know proper Rusus. That is a chief power, yes, but I can make it appear as if I am in different places. I can even multiply myself in the presence of danger. That is what we've been fighting, Fadis said to the others. No flesh and blood group of Rusis, but him and his conjurings. Some of those bled, Curla said. Perhaps rogue Rusis? Why would you be fighting my people? What do the Rusis have against you? The man suddenly stood, wobbling as he did so, but coughing and looking around. This region is Taria? Yes, Fadis said. 
There are no dwarves here. They have mines all over the mountains. Fadis looked at the ruins behind him, and the Rusis turned. He then ran up the hill, much to the dismay of those around him. He stumbled, pulling at the earth to reach the upper level, and then paused. Fadis and the others had their weapons ready. Perhaps this was all a ruse, a trick by their near-defeated enemy. But the Rusis walked forward, glancing up at the sky and the sun, and then down again at one of the pillars. Where are my people? he asked them. The Rusis are a broken race, Nikali said. The Dwemhar, the Dwemhar won. His fists tightened and his gauntlets glowed brightly. Tell me, where are they? You elf, he said, jerking toward Nikali. There is a Dwemhar city on the coast that you speak of. Who leads them? Nikali shook his head and made a deep sigh. He understood what the others were starting to of their adversary. The Dwemhar ascended, at least those who were not destroyed. The Dwemhar city that once was in no more. Sailmark, elven capital of the West, stands in its place. The Rusus fell to his knees. Where was I? Where was I when my people needed me? Who are you? He is Rungar, Nikeli said. A Rusus hero bearing the gauntlets of his kin, capable of creating power beyond any normal Rusus, capable of feeding his magic nearly unending. He was thought lost with the fall of Renegress. The Rusis began to cry, his tears staining the dwarven ruins. How long has it been that I have not been as myself? That we cannot tell you, Nikeli said, but it has been many hundreds of years since the fall of Renegress. The Rusis stood, looking at those around him. He then looked to Evry and Nikeli. Your armor, what bastard gave you that? Evry was taken aback by his comment. Gifts from the Dwemar, a blending of their magic and elven craftsmanship. Rungar cracked a partial smile. I'd given that back. Aside from the back, it is of that cursed people. The Dwemhar are no longer the enemy you once fought, Fadis said. You speak as their ally. I am allied to one who protects the realms and prevents a coming darkness that is yet unknown. Strange thing to protect, Rungar gripped his head. I see flashes. Why do I feel so much pain in my mind? Was I struck? Fadis sheathed his sword, as did the others. You took a severe blast a bit ago. Rungar rubbed his injuries as his gauntlets glowed. The burns and scrapes were healed. If only this worked with my mind. You know nothing of where you came from or your acts under the king of Taria? Who is this king? A vile ruler of the race of men, Nikeli said. Men? Men are weak. Mere pawns for us to learn to manage and love. They have little in terms of use beyond that. Fadis went to speak, but Nekeli did first. Rusis, Dwemar, and Elves worked together at one time. A new enemy comes upon us, an enemy you may know of. Vampires. I know not of such creatures. Bloodsuckers, created by a summoning to the living realm that should not have ever lived. They threaten all our lands, and our allies are few. This king you have been serving brings undue suffering, starting wars between the races. We were sent to kill him. You protected him, or so we thought. Tarvira, he suddenly said. Yes, Fadis said. That is the name of his keep. I remember a place of stone, a place of safety there. I also remember a place of shadow where the sun never fully rises, where blood runs over tall mountains of stone and bone. I smell that of sulfur. The ocean is cruel upon the coast. The shadow lands of the east, Nikali said. Yes, I was there. I was seeking something or someone. It seems you failed, Nikali said. Perhaps you were captured yourself? Cursed? Who knows what the elves of that region did? Rungar gripped his hand and then tore off a ring. He stared at it and fearfully pushed it to Nikali. Blackness, Nikali said. Those rings were lost. 
How did you come by this? What is it? Fadis asked. The wearers fall to the will of whoever holds a staff that has the twin core like that which is in the ring. This is old, very old. I feel my mind clearing, yet I still do not have full thoughts, but I see now. I was captured or tricked in the East. This is how I do not know what I have been doing. I have been a pawn for as long as this ring was upon my finger. No more. I do not know what I have done, but you have shown me kindness and reserve not taking my life. Tell me, what can I do to assist you? I still work to know who or what I am doing now, and my heart weeps of my city, but I will help you destroy that whom has controlled me. You mention a place at Tarvira. Yes, I do not know exactly what my words even mean, but there must be something there. We have no other trails, Nikeli said. We should return to the ship and to Valrin. The girl, Fadis said. Rungar suddenly turned behind him and went to a large outcropping of rocks. Fadis followed him as someone began screaming. Rungar backed away quickly, and Fadis went in. Cowering behind a wall of large stones, the young daughter of the innkeeper stared out at Fadis with wide eyes. Please, no, please. No one will hurt you, not even the one who took you. You are safe. Your mother sent me to take you. The child still recoiled from Fadis, but Curla knelt, and the girl seemed both surprised and afraid. You are one of the ones my mom told me of. You want to sell me? No. No, my dear. None of us are of that. We want to destroy those who do that. The girl's gaze traced behind all three of them, and they turned to see Nekali. You are an elf, she said. I am. I am here with these who have already spoken to you. We do not mean you harm. The girl seemed to smile. I'll go with him. You three must stay back. The three of them quickly obeyed the little girl's commands, and soon they were walking with the little girl in Nekali's arms, making a point to stay well back. I love elves. My mom told me stories about them every night since I was three. And how old are you now? Nekali asked. Eight years and several moons. And you, good elf? Nekali smiled. Much older much older than even your village and every village in this region. They began down through the woods, finding a river that snaked down the side of the mountain and had a flat, stony surface that was easy for them to follow. This way will take you to my home, but I wasn't born there. I was born in Lokam. Lokam is a beautiful city. The waterfalls on its southern side are quite a sight, Nikeli replied. As the others walked well behind, Rungar leaned into Fadis. The race of men has come far, I see. I remember when they awoke. I remember the sight of them. It was so strange for them to have no powers of great skills. They were truly children in the simplest of sense, and even when they were older, they made the poorest of decisions. In some ways, we are no different, Fadis said. I could say the same of some of the other races. Then truly it is as we feared. That wisdom would fall away in the stem of personal pride and grandeur. Perhaps I can have a hand in curving our races back toward the paths we must take. Upon reaching the village, the companions had an interchange of thanks to the much-relieved mother who offered them to stay, but they refused and quickly took their leave. Those who had been present in the early morning were gone, and while the strange glances and stares still came from those few there, they worked to move toward the coastline as quickly as they could. The night would soon be upon them. The rising black moon was not a sight that gave them comfort, and even Rungar took notice of the anomaly. These have never boded well for our lands. Are these vampires you speak of? Yes, a great host of elves and men have gone to stop that which comes, but we do not know of their fates, Nikeli told him. As they came to the shoreline, Rungar paused and pointed. A realm ship. You lie. This is a Dwemhar trap. 
The ruses summoned his spells, but then stopped not out of conscience, but by Nikali's sword at his neck. We did not lie. We will not lie. This is the stormborn Valrin. His ship, the Isla Sunrise, is a vessel of the Dwemhar. They have a companion, a woman. She has the powers of the Dwemhar, but also that of Rusis. Will you attack her too? It was a rhetorical question, and Rungar ceased his spells. As the Ayla sunrise drew closer to the shore, Fadis pointed to the other vessel. Do you remember that? No, I only remember a place of stone. Beyond that I see flashes of the Shadowlands. I am fortunate to have my memories of before, but it seems that is ancient history to my present company. The Archons of Sailmark would very much like to speak with you then. Nikaeli said. I prefer blade work, but they prefer their minds. I'm sure you could have a good conversation with their historians. Valrin looked out from the helm of the ship with a reservation at the Rusus with them. As the Ayla sunrise came ashore, the others jumped onto the vessel, and the ship's powers drew it back out to deeper water. Valrin, stormborn of the north, meet Rungar, Rusus of Rinagres one of the last true ruses, and a man who comes from the past into our present. He was under the effect of a ring of particular power, and he does not know his actions, but the king is likely in the place we were before. Cowering, Rungar said. Not that I know that, but I feel it. The man is like a ground squirrel, hiding from everything. I've been assisting a coward. Perhaps by the time we return to the city, I will remember where he hid himself. Valrin, he said, bowing. It is good to meet you. Valrin looked at those aboard and glanced to the trees. Where are the others? Every looked at Valrin. They died in our task. They are lost. Our task yet stands, and we must complete it. Please, take us with haste back to the castle. The night sky passed over them, and while the others rested, Rungar stood at the front of the ship, looking up at the stars. Fadis stood with Valrin. So, who is he? Nekeli seemed to know of him. I assume Aveum will. He has gauntlets that give him more power than any normal Rusus, and evidently he fought the Dwemhar. Valrin stared at him in shock. He knows now the state of the world, but he is still troubled. I know I would be. The night sky suddenly flashed white, and a wave struck the ship itself from beneath. Rungar spun around and ran to the helm. I know that. I know that power. What? Fadis asked. The others were startled awake and quickly went for their weapons, but it was the brightness growing in the sky to the south that caught their eyes. A Dwemhar power of tremendous destruction, I do fear for any host caught in that. With haste, Fadis said to Valrin, we must get back to the others as quickly as possible. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. Bry was shaken from her bed. She rushed outside to see the bright ball of fire in the southern sky. She shielded her eyes, and then it was gone, whatever it was. She slipped on her clothing and hurried outside. The ranger captain was standing there with several others. Send out ravens. We must seek eyes that know what has transpired. He turned to Bry. I do not know what that was, but I have never seen anything like it. That is to the south where the host is. I know. I don't know what has happened, but we must prepare ourselves. If the elves and my brothers and sisters have failed... That which Andok and Badur have told us so much about will be upon us. We must prepare the city. If you pray to the gods, he said, now is the time to ask for their guidance. The city, at least the parts of it where people were sleeping, was now awake. A strong wind blew out from the south that was the foulest they had ever smelled. Bry looked down at several plants and noticed the leaves were withering. The gates of Tarvira were open and people fled inside the protection of the walls. It was as if a storm were growing to the far south. Some time passed, 
and Andok and Badur rode in with several dozen rangers riding up to the inner keep. There was a great light, Andok shouted, like dwarven dust but much worse. The elves they survived. An orb shielded them, and it is said the god Ether's light shined down upon them. You saw it? Bry asked. No, I received a raven from those closer. Several dwarves were in the company of rangers. These are our friends, Andok said. Brook and the mining companions of our little guild. I thought we were done with the fighting, the dwarf said. But I and my kin are ready to help. And we need all we can gather. Shadows move in the south, Badur said. We need to flee the city. We must get to elven lands. Where are the armies of Taria? We shall need them. They are not here. They are still between here and Sailmark, Ridua said, and likely friend to the king. The king matters little in what comes, Andok said. Horns sounded in the distance. Andok, Bry, Badur, and Ridua ran up the stairwell to the walls. The host of Taria was riding in. Close the gates, Ridua shouted out. The gates at the lower city wall were shut. Come, Ridua said to the others. As they made their way to the lower walls and hurried to the gateway, several dozen horsemen rode upon the gate and began to circle. Bry could hear them shouting, but could not make it out until they were nearly to the upper area of the gatehouse. Who dares shut the gates of Tarvira in front of the command of Taria's armies? Rangers of the north, Ridua shouted. We have taken this keep and killed the king. The king has told me such, the man shouted. I have received word from our king, and we have come to release your occupation. You fool, Andok shouted. Did you not see the flash that made the ground tremble and the night sky turn white? Do you not know what comes? I am a knight of Taria, the man shouted out. I do not fear that of elf or dwarf. I and the armies of Taria will smash this gate and take what is ours. If you do not open these gates, all which is beyond will be sacrificed for the good of the king. Your king is a coward. He fled with assassins on his tail, Bry shouted. Our king is safe. He has told me. I shall take back his keep, and if I do not kill you, he will. Let all present know that I rode to your gates and asked entry. You denied. You have signed your own death contracts this night. And then... The knight and the other knights with him spurred their horses away. The armies of Taria formed a large line on the western line of the city. They were out of bow range. They have catapults, Andok said. We must send word to the elves of Sailmark. Taria will not expect an attack. They must come to our aid, Bry said. We can try, but there are many enemies in the darkness now. We must hope our elven allies can not only rally, but get here in time without their own troubles. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. Valrin and the others did not try to get any more rest in their flight back to Tarvira. Soon they could see flashes of light in the heavy fogs rolling over the sea. What is this? Fadis questioned. The Ayla sunrise came around the cape, and they could see arching trails of fire. Who attacks the castle? Evry asked. We are too far to tell, Nikaeli said. But I would guess that Taria has come to reclaim its keep. Bray, Valrin said. He was near the edge of the veiled passage and was heading to move back where they had boarded at the base of the keep when Rungar stood up and ran to the front of the ship. I know this place, he said with excitement, and then his demeanor shifted. I know where he hides. Though Valrin had no intention of attempting to make it through the collapsed passage, Rungar pointed. This way. I will open that which is closed. The Ruses stood with one leg on the railings of the ship and summoned a large orb of ice, channeling it into the oceans beneath the stone, sending a massive spike of ice through the crumbled stone before shifting his magic, blasting the base of the rock with fire and sending up a blast of water and rock. The passage was opened. Go there, into the docks, Rungar said. 
As the Ayla Sunrise came to rest against the docks where before they had watched the king supposedly escape, Rungar jumped from the ship with Evry, Kirla, and Nikili just behind him. Fadis and Valrin trailed behind as they went back to the stairwell. He is in the castle? Kirla asked. They were nearly halfway up the hidden stairwell that led to the king's chambers. Not quite, Rungar said. He stopped, sending a blast of fire against random rock and shattering a wooden door nearly impossible to see if it weren't for the burning cinders from where it remained. The passage they took was yet another secret passage within the bowels of the castle. Rungar used his powers to light their way. Valrin grabbed Fadis. I'm going to check on Bry. I can do nothing compared to you against the king. I have to check that she is okay. Go, Fadis said. We will do this. As Valrin went on up into the castle, Fadis drew his sword. There was nowhere for the coward to hide now. Rungar led them through a twisting path of tunnels and then caves. They had come to more dwarven ruins, but these had many comforts of that which a pompous royal king might need. There were barrels of ale, wine, and many food stocks. There was a grand bed and empty cages around his bed, having not the time to secure his playthings. The room was empty except for a closed door that went into a brick column at the center of the room. Rungar stopped just short of the door and looked at the others with a crooked smile. My king, I have returned. What do you need of me? Is that you? A voice said back. My little pet? Safe at last? Have you killed those pigs who sought to root out your master? Rungar sent a blast of fire at the door, and the wood was burnt to cinders, falling away, revealing the cowering form that was the king. He held a silver staff and made motions with it toward Rungar. The Rusis ran to the king and ripped the staff away from him. I protected you before. I was a slave to you before. You wished for none other to know of this place, and now that is your folly. Now, I speak for myself now. You are not my master. Every and Nikali rushed the king, pulling him from the closet in which he hid and throwing him out into the open room. Their blades were at his neck. He looked up, his face red and tears falling from his eyes. He looked to Kurla. I am a kind king. I was never rude to you or your other friends. I only hated the elves. The elves are the enemy of Taria. Look now, this one holds a blade to my neck. Both Evry and Nikali pushed their blades into his skin, spilling his blood. He screamed and fell onto his hands, trembling as he grasped where their blades had been. Kirla knelt to him. I remember what you did to those I called friend. What you did to me. Let me remind you. She slashed across his chest, a swift but not very deep gash. As he looked at her, she slapped him and jabbed him with her blade in his cheek. More blood fell upon the ground, and the king looked at Fadis. Ranger, I remember you. Do you remember my wife? Your wife? No, he said, shaking his head. No, I didn't do this back then. I may be a bit worse than then, but I didn't take those as I do now. I wanted you to come back. You wanted me dead. You wanted my family dead. My wife died then. But do not worry, my son and I survived. Your son, good. I am glad. Now, can we talk about this? He said, raising his hands in surrender. You sent assassins for our king, you pig of Taria, Nikali shouted. You took my love and struck her with severe suffering. I have wronged you all, but I can change. I can always change, and I am king of Taria, and I have a name. Do you not even care to use my title, elf? Fadis sheathed his sword. No, we don't. The king sighed in partial relief. Fadis stood gripping his bow. A bow like this was the prize you sought before. Back then I was a ranger of the north. I protected these lands against evil and served the people. The moment I served a master, I was led astray. I returned to what I was before, what I am now. I am still a ranger. I have changed, but I've always been quick to act on my what my heart demands of me. My choice here is simple. 
before the king could speak again, Fadis had drawn his bow and sent an arrow into his skull. Nikeli, Evry, and Kurla thrust their blades into his body a moment later, with Kurla making several extra stabs before she fell backward, crying. Fadis went to her, embracing her as Evry went to him. Nikeli made a single slash and severed the king's head. I will take this to Suvasel. He will be pleased. We shall take our oaths as leaves of Sailmark with pride once again. Rungar bowed to those around. Fate has led me to be amongst you now. I cannot deny that I have questions. The ground quaked again, and then, even in the deep places beneath the castle, they made out the sounds of horn calls, but they could not determine who it was. Come, Fadi said. Let us hurry to our friends. Part 11. Shadows of the Black Moon. Valrin rushed out of the keep, heading to the walls where he saw a lone Rusis, with many rangers at her side, sending volleys of arrows into the fray beneath them. He hurried to Bry as quickly as he could run. Smoke and fire rose up in the city, and he pushed through crowds of people fleeing from the fiery destruction in the lower level and stacking up in the king's hall. Another shockwave rocked the ground. Valrin stumbled up the stairwell but made it to Bry. Valrin, you made it back! They embraced, and he glanced over her shoulder to see the armies of Taria moving into the city. She left the wall for a moment, moving just down the stairs as more rangers moved atop the walls. Where are the others? Killing the king. He never left, he told her. Never left? Then the knight was right, the Ridua said, coming to Valrin. Bry told me much of you, Stormborn, but alas, I think you're safer on your ship. Taria approaches. He turned to his men. Rangers! We shall punish them for every piece of ground they take. If they want this castle, it will cost them more than I believe they can pay. Several more rocks flung into the lower level of the city. Horsemen were coming up the main road now, but were thrown down by the arrow fire of the rangers. Valrin and Bry went back up to the wall. Infantry was moving forward in the lower levels. Their shields were up, and though arrows still found marks within the line, another shield was quickly raised to block the fire. Villagers still fled into the inner keep, escaping the flames, but as the shield wall drew closer, they let in the last few who had made it before shutting and barring the doors. As the infantry below dropped their shields, bowmen in their ranks fired up along the wall, striking down rangers one after another. Those of the village, not rangers, but normal villagers who had long been forced into slavery and poorly treated by the king, lifted rocks and dropped them on the Taria soldiers. Where is the oil? the captain shouted. Valrin looked over, seeing a large cooking pot with a fire roaring beneath it just off to the side. Not ready, sir. It took us forever to get it warm. It isn't ready. We must pray the elves come, he said to Bry. Horns called in the distance, but it was not the elves. It was horns of men. At the doorway of the keep, the entire structure shook. Taria had brought up a battering ram. More of Taria? Andok and Badur ran with Brook and his dwarven friends to the gate. They're breaking through, Brook shouted. We must reinforce the gate. More arrows flew into the rangers on the wall. As Badur went to the gate, Andok went to the captain. Fogs roll across the fields. Soon we shall have worse than angry knights to deal with. It was a few more moments before the host that had dealt with the king came to the courtyard. See? Nikeli shouted, holding aloft the head of the king. The king is dead! Ridua took a spear and placed the king's head atop it. If you do not mind, I'd like to borrow this. I go to check on my love, Nikeli said. It seems our situation is most dire. Bry suddenly summoned her powers. Valrin looked toward the keep and saw that Rungar had just stepped out. No, he told her. He was under mind control. He is one of your ancestors, an old Rusis from the city of Rinagres. Rinagres? But he'd have to be hundreds of years old, if not older. Valrin smiled. 
Let us survive this, and perhaps we can talk to him of it. See your king, warriors of Taria! Ridua shouted out. The smashing sound of the battering ram ceased even though the door itself had cracked. The horn sounded again. This time, it was followed by several short blasts and another long blast. The men at the gates began to fall back, some of them keeping their shields up as they did, and others fleeing. The king is dead, they shouted. The king has fallen. But the horn calls that those defending the keep heard were not in response to the death of the king. The deep fogs had rolled over them completely. The black moon above them seemed to burn brightly with a fire around its edges. Fogs rolled up to the walls of the city, but through the flames of the lower level, they could still see the outer walls. Through the veil upon their sight, the moon appeared more ominous. The rangers on the walls fell back from their positions as the moon turned a hue of green and then red before shifting back to black. Screeches filled the air. Rangers! Bows to the sky! Andok shouted. But the creatures of the night had a feast to take part in, and the screams of the armies of Taria were loud and frantic. Valrin, Fadis, and Bry stood on the walls next to the captain. They could not see the army that was attacking them only a few minutes before, but their screams were constant. We have little time, Badur said. He is right, Andok confirmed. We must leave. Get these people as far from here as we can. When they are done with those in the fields, they will come here. We have too many, the captain said. I refuse to leave these people. We are rangers of Taria. We will defend our land and our people. Get to these walls, rangers. We will not leave this keep unprotected. I am Ridua, half-elf of Taria. Let them come. The rangers moved back up onto the walls. Several had moved into the towers that overlooked the keep itself and taken braziers with them. Anyone willing and able to fight, brandish what weapons you can, Fadi shouted out. Get the women and children into the hall and shut the doors. Rungar went to help a woman as two of her children fell, and she screamed, Not you! How are you here? You serve the king! Rungar recoiled, looking around at panicked looks. Fadis went to him and motioned to the captain, who had noticed the Rusis when before. He had not paid him much attention considering everything else going on. I have truly wronged these people, Rungar said. They fear me. Think nothing of it at this moment. We must hold this place. Every picked up a bow and a quiver of arrows. They have sent for the elven host, he told Fadis. But if these creatures attack, I cannot think any of our friends could have survived. And if they did, they went back to elven lands. We are alone. Every ran up to the walls. Kirlo worked to move people into the keep as several groups of villagers brandished weapons and assembled, ready to help. Rungar, Fadis said. The Rusus was staring at the ground. I am not what I once was. I am but a shell. Andok shouted down from the walls. Those with spears or stones to the wall. They come up the main road. Bring oil. Bring the oil now. Screeching cut across the courtyard. As pairs carrying hot oil made their way to the walls and villagers followed Andok's commands, the door to the keep rattled. Small flying beasts shot across the walls, taking down defenders as more of their kind came from the clouds above. To the skies! Rangers, loose your arrows! The flying creatures that had descended upon the host defending Greater Crescent Lake dropped down upon those of the keep. Valrin, Kirla, and the others slashed several of the beasts as they attacked those in the courtyard. Fadis drew his blade, rushing to cut into one of the bony wings just before it grabbed Kirla from behind. The creatures retreated upward, swooping back down upon those at the gateway. Bry lifted her hands, sending blasts of lightning into those beasts, bringing them down as several shadows dropped within the keep itself. The dwarf Bruck with the ranger Badur ran toward one of them as two more appeared near Valrin and Fadis. Defenders of men! The elves could not stop us! 
You have nothing that will repel us, a vampire lord cried. His pale form was shrouded in black armor with curved spikes that deflected the man's swords that came against him. He lunged for Valrin, but Fada stepped forward, catching his teeth with his blade. The vampire slashed him, cutting his armor and slashing his stomach. Valrin thrust his blade into the vampire's upper chest as yet another vampire appeared and bit into a nearby villager. Fadis attempted to thrust his own sword at his attacker, but his foe ran him against the wall of the keep, leaving the others behind. His sword fell from his hand. He went for the dagger he kept in his boot, but couldn't reach it. Suddenly, an arrow struck the vampire from behind. He looked beyond and saw every on the walls, just as a strange form climbed up behind him, knocking him from the wall. Fadis ran, pushing past several more winged creatures as Brye sent a blast of her magic toward more creatures swarming the inside portion of the gateway. Smoke and fire rose from the keep walls as oil burned, but did nothing more than slow the advance of the attackers. He pushed past Rungar, who was still standing in the center of the courtyard, seemingly dead to all that happened around him. Fadis found Evry on top of his broken bow. What is this? Fadis heard a voice cry out. Nikeli and his wife held their blades at the ready at the keep as several vampire lords stood in a line, attempting to walk into the keep. Fools! Nikeli shouted. To try to take on Nikeli and Selby of Salemark! Fadis pulled Evry to his feet. You saved me back there, son. It was a lucky shot. Every said, wincing in pain as he started to laugh. Just a rib. Give me a sword. I won't be useless. Fadis grabbed a sword for him and Every, turning to look at the gateway as two dwarves worked to block it, even as the frame was beginning to give way. Ridua shot an arrow of fire high into the sky and then jumped into the courtyard. How many still come? Andok shouted to him. All of them! Valrin and Kirla were now beside Nikeli and his wife. The vampires in the courtyard were growing in number, and one of them seemed to laugh as more now stood blocking the way into the keep. But as a current of lightning struck their sides in an enveloping wave of magic, the vampires on the side swung around to go for Bry, the lone caster who harassed them. Several of them struck her from different angles, knocking her away. She pushed herself up, sending a blast of fire at one and ice to another, throwing a bolt into the ground and knocking back two more. Demon men crawled over the walls, engaging the rangers, Fadis, and his son. Bry was alone, and even Valrin could not reach her. She sent a blast in a rapid spin around her, enveloping demon men and vampire alike, but several clawed hands slashed her. Blood splattered in the mud of the keep. Bry! Valrin shouted out. She clawed at the mud, trying to look up. She could feel their clawed hands upon her, see the glisten of their fangs nearing her body. But then a bright flash overtook them all, and another form grabbed her. I have you, Rusis. It was Rungar, his gauntlets alight. His face, splashed with the blood of his kin, had awoken him and pulled him from the darkness of the depression he had fallen into. The Ruses sent a bright flash of burning magic in a wave spinning like a cyclone in the courtyard of the castle keep. The vampires were turned to ash, and though the flames struck the entire structure around them, those he did not intend to burn were spared. The gates gave way, and the forces of the vampire lords swarmed as the creatures from the skies descended. Rungar dropped Bry and ran into the fray of enemies that came his way. His magic turned from fire to ice. He sent shards of ice so quickly that small cracks split the air of the keep, the blasts tearing apart all that came to the gateway, and in an undulating flash of blue and white, he sent a stream of ice and solidified the gateway. He was now upon the gateway itself, alone upon the walls. The Rusis of Rinagris, Rungar, the lost hero, slave of the king of Taria, Released by Fadis, Ranger of the North, lifted his hands to the sky, and the fogs receded. From his form, lightning shot upward and into the clouds, and in a thundering crack that shook the ground many times stronger than the rocks striking the city before, 
he wrought destruction upon all that threatened those of Tarvira. Valorin ran to Bry as the rangers, as well as Fadis and Evry, fell back toward the keep. They could see nothing save the dark outline of Rungar on the walls. He is a hero to the Rusus, Bry said. His gauntlets give him power beyond any Rusus of the time. He was a true legend to my people. I cannot believe he is alive, and he is here. The fogs that had swarmed the castle had been pushed back. Rungar lowered his hands. All was still. He turned, looking back at those of the keep. Fadis looked and saw that many within the keep itself were slowly emerging. That's the ruses of the king, some of them said. Yes, but he saved us. The captain of the rangers ran to the walls, as did the others. Valrin, Fadis, and all who had worked to throw down the king and defend the keep. Their enemy had fallen back, at least for now. Elven horns called in the distance. Fadis looked out to see the elven host of Sailmark approaching with haste. They had survived and answered the call for help of the men of Taria. I did not think they could be defeated, Rungar said. I could not see beyond myself, and then I could. Fadis lifted Rungar's hand to the crowd of villagers behind them. This is Rungar, the savior of Tarvira, and with him the rangers of Taria have secured a new place for all people. The elves of the West join with us against the terrors you saw this night, but now you have seen the power that the gods of the North bestow upon us to protect us from that which we all fear. Take heart, embrace him and all who have come together. The villagers, though still in a state of fear and shock, clapped and some cheered. Your actions before do not make you who you are this day or can be tomorrow, Fadis told him. Trust me on this. He smiled, glancing toward Evry. Though the elven host stayed on the outskirts of the city, several figures approached up the main road. Rungar, can we take down this wall of ice? Fadis asked. It worked well, but I think the elves would rather not have to climb up the walls. Rungar laughed and in a few moments of spell-casting, the ice melted. Evern was the first to enter the keep, his staff at the ready, his stance relaxed as he saw those around him. Valrin, he said, spotting the captain. I had feared the worst upon receiving word of need. Avium and Ruach, as well as Richt, followed by King Suvasel, entered the gateway. Evry and Nekeli went before the king bowing. We have killed the king of Taria. He no longer breathes, good king. Suvasel was one of the few on horses, but he dismounted and embraced both of them. It seems you have also played a role in taking his fortress, an asset in the coming darkness. People of Taria, King Suvasel shouted out. A large group of villagers had come to the courtyard with the arrival of the elves. I am not your enemy nor do I hold you responsible for the actions of your king. Know that war did come upon my woods. Those of you with sons, brothers, husbands, and the like within the Taria army who were lost this night were not destroyed by elven weapons. I cannot say what drove the king to madness or of the orders that were given to destroy this castle, but I have moved to secure all settlements of Taria. We will not let your people stand alone against this enemy. The rangers of the north and the riverlands are made up of your people. Once though lesser by me, their actions with that of many brave warriors have risen to meet this enemy. I will further unite these lands. We will defeat these new foes, these vampires of Elria Sona. Their queens will cower within their caves, and under moonlight and starlight, will face them in every wood, beside the rivers that stretch over our lands and beside the oceans. I, King Suvasel, swear I will not put my blade down until we can all sleep without the threat of demon men or creatures of the shadowy night. The crowd lauded the elven king and his warriors. Though the stench of death was heavy upon the castle, 
Archons within the Elven forces made a point to extinguish the fires, and the extra hands worked to fortify the lower level and begin rebuilding. With the large host of elves camping in the fields for the moment, many of the hosts began building elven structures in the trees near the castle. Suvasel intended to create a fortress of his own in Taria, and though some of the older villagers seemed to be disturbed by the elven presence, not one of them could deny that the assistance of the elves was both overly welcomed and needed. Inside the keep of the castle, Suvasel sat at the throne of the Taria king, but not before his archons converted the throne from the throne of Taria, set with jewels and polished wood, to that of a living throne of wood adorned with flowers that fed on the light from the skylights high above. The attendants of the castle bowed before the king, but he waved them off. I do not need your services. Long have you served the rat of a king, and I beg you to go to your families. Tend to what is needed of you beyond these walls. All seemed to listen, save the one servant. Bri noticed that she bowed to the king's command, but instead she simply stood at the kitchen door. Bri and Valrin went to her as the food was prepared behind her by the kitchen staff Bri had seen before. Do you now want to at least rest? Bri asked her. She smiled and shook her head. I am much happier to just be alive and able to continue doing what I love. At least now I will not see the horrors I did under the old king. King Suvasel has elected to put a governor over this castle, someone to guard it. He will not be staying, but I do not know who he intends to place, Valrin said. Any is better, she replied. Where is the head cook? Bri asked. The man she had spared before, whose brother had been murdered by the Rusis, was busy stirring a pot and put down the spoon. He approached her, smiling. I am. The lard of a bastard before jumped from the cliffs when the first attack came. After whatever had knocked out my friends here, we made sure that Nana here was safe and prepared to defend her if needed. Nana nodded. Yes, they did. A fine new head chef for the kitchen. The man bowed to Bry. My family and I will bury my brother at a place in the woods. I thank you for sparing me as you did, you and your friends. Bry smiled and returned the bow. I only wish your brother was alive. What of that Rusus? I know he saved us from the vampires, but he was so evil before. He was controlled, Valrin said. Fadis came up behind them, having heard the last bit of the conversation as he waited for a good point to interrupt. Rungar had no idea what he was doing and did the will of the king without knowing, though he has vanished since the arrival of the elves. Nana nodded. He is likely atop the castle. He would typically stand up there, especially at night. But that was his place. A meal was served in the castle, and more food was given out in the courtyard as the surviving villagers took a break from working to relax for a bit. The cloud cover and cold northern winds signaled the coming winter, and while most stored stock and food was lost, the elves moved to bring more food, and, using their magic, grew crops to maturity. Evening fell upon the castle again. The leaders of the elven host and that which had come to kill the king gathered together on an outside patio, overlooking the cliffs and ocean but high above the keep walls. In the room just before the doorway to the outside, they had found a library with many volumes of texts with so much dust on them. It was clear that the king, not to mention anyone else, had not opened them in some time. The only one not present was Fadis. As Suvasel and Ruach smoked their pipes, and Richt and several archons read through the texts in the library, Andok and Badur joked with Brook and Bry. Avorn and Valrin sat cross-legged before the king, and the captain of the rangers made a point to list out the places where rangers watched the woods on the borders. All the messages I have received says the vampires fell back to the region near the Crescent Lakes. I also understand that the houses of men have fortified the riverlands. Elven strong points remain as well, Suvasel said. 
Mikronok and the dwarven kingdoms are working with my kin to craft mirrors of fire and light to divert the creatures that so devour darkness. I do not know the exact magic they use, but it seems it may be useful. Still, I hear of Arusis who defended this place. Bray of the Aela Sunrise, your powers surprise me. Bray shook her head. No, king, that was not me. Richt and the other Archons emerged from the library as a group, enough of a random occurrence that all on the patio turned to look. Fadis approached with Rungar. King Suvasel, Fadis began, let me introduce he who saved us. King Suvasel stood and his hand went for his blade, but he did not draw it. Ruach was up as well, following his king. I need no introduction to the elven king, Fadis, Rungar said. You were believed dead, Suvasel stated. I knew of your fall and of your city. You still bear the gauntlets you wore then, though you will find no enemy here unless you seek it. Rungar bowed deep. The Rusus regarded the dwarves over the elves for some time, but I must not seek enemies in this world. It seems I already have plenty. His eyes then shifted to Richt, the purified one, but who had been a Dwemhar. His eyes then looked toward Evium, seeing her hand summoning a bit of fire as he looked down at his own hands and his gauntlets glowing. Fadis shook him, and he stopped summoning his power. I see one I counted as enemy, he said, not breaking his stare at Richt. Rusus, Richt said. I was once, but am no longer. I know you, though. Your face is in my mind, but I cannot see who you were. Then let us leave it at that, Suvasel stated. You are Rungar, a high Rusis, wielder of artifacts of your people, once mourned of by your kin, whom I have known through the years. Embrace Avium, also of the crew of the Stormborn. She is both Rusis and Dwemhar. The strangest combination, and I would much like to speak to her of this, but King... I have thought much of the current state of this castle and the world. I would like to return to your place to the east, but I wish to stay here and protect the people I have wronged. I hold dominion over these regions as it is now, but the ranger captain and half-elf Riduo will hold governorship here. I see no reason why you cannot remain here. Neither do I, the half-elf said. You're a hero to my men and women. The people still talk of you in the streets. They cannot believe your power. Power comes and goes, Evern finally stated. The Shadow Elf stood up. What of our next moves? You wanted us all present for something, yet you do not speak of it. Suvasel repacked his pipe, almost as if ignoring the Shadow Elf, but no one else spoke. Rusis and Shadow Elves came against the once king, he said at last. I know that some Rusis were but shades created by Rungar, but others were not. We found such writings from the east in the king's belongings. It was brought to me by the captain when he found it was written in a language he nor his rangers could read. Suvasel reached into his pocket and rolled out a scroll. Yes, this is it. He tossed it at Evern's feet. Evern reached down and slowly stood, staring at the writing. Valrin leaned over to see what it was, but could not make out the writing. This is not of the Shadowlands, but the writing is the same. The writing is of the tongue of the East. The insignia is of interest to me. These are renegades, those willing to fight for whoever pays them. I do not know who the king used to get in contact with them, but a high elf of any kind going near those lands would be killed. To the Shadowlands? Valrin asked. No, another place. A place where, of all in our company, it would be Evium who would have a tie to it. Her mother is known here as the Scourge Siren. I know that name, Rungar said. She is the mother of Evium. Why would you seek any of that peninsula and the city there? It is no longer a peninsula nor a city like you remember, Evorn said. It is an island north of the Shadowlands. Valrin, those we met at the dwarven city of the Barb King, the Veret gamblers of Ayaklo, they hail from that place. Evorn stared at Suvasel. You seek them? 
The vampires know of us. Soon they'll figure out a way to stop even our leaves from getting close. Their magic, their queens know our blood, but the shadow elves they do not. I will not seek help from the east, but these killers may be different. I want you and your crew to go there, he said, looking at Valrin. Seek out their assistance and know that you go with my word that no price is too high for their services. Can we not send a message? Fadis asked. No, Evern said. We must go there. They do not reveal themselves to just anyone, and the fact that any among the race of men could somehow acquire their services is strange to me. But it is not my decision, King. Valrin was suddenly the center of attention. Evern coughed. Perhaps he would like to ponder this without sets of eyes upon him. Valrin shook his head and walked in the center of those present. No, the only way this can happen is if we do it, he said to his crew, looking at each of them. I am the Stormborn of the North, but I have started upon this path and must see it through. If there is another the king trusts, they can do it. Valrin was intentionally silent, and of course no one spoke. He exhaled. Then it is as it is. We will seek the Veret gamblers of Ayeklo. Then may the gods of the north watch over you, Rungar stated, for that place is not one of the elves, dwarves, Dwemhar, or Rusis. Evil sleeps upon that place. He looked at Avium. Evil without a name or one to bind to. We of the Aela Sunrise do not fear any place, Bry said, embracing Valrin. You will, Rungar said. Stormborn Saga Hash 6 is available now. Listen on YouTube or purchase directly from the author at www.dwemharelmsbooks.com.